We are now at our regular town council meeting. Uh, this is town council meeting number 17-22 on Tuesday, September 20th, 2022 here in uh, Freeport Town Council Chambers at Town Hall. Uh, we'll start with a roll call. Uh, tonight with us we have Councillor Pillsbury, Presence. Councillor Fournier, Here. Councillor Lawrence, here. Councillor Bradley, here. Councillor Egan, here. and the Chair Dan Filch is here. Councillor Daniele is excused. He is out of town. So with that, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, so before we dive in, we would like to consider the minutes from meeting number 16-22, which was held on September 6th, uh, and accept those minutes. Does anybody have any comments, corrections? Would anybody like to make that motion? I'll make the motion. Uh, and Councilor, <laughs> thank you, Councilor Lawrence and Councilor Bradley with a second. Uh, all in favor of accepting the minutes as printed? Aye. Aye. That's everybody. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have some announcements. I have quite a few tonight. I have three, and they're each a little bit long. Uh, the first one is about the uh, library, the Friends of the Freeport Community Library book sale is back. Uh, it's September 23rd through the 25th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Preview night is September 22nd from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. and that's $20 per family or $10 with a Freeport library card. Book sale volunteers can attend the preview night at no charge. They have lots of great programs lined up for the fall including musical performances for children and adults. Visit freeportlibrary.com or their Facebook page for more information. And I believe we're going to be hearing a lot about the library later on tonight. Uh, it's a big library night. Uh, next up is the assessing department has completed its annual analysis and calculation of all real and personal property valuations. With our yearly analysis and updates, the current real estate valuations are in line with market value. Therefore, there was no need to make townwide valuation adjustments. The fiscal year 2023 saw a taxable valuation increase of 2.01%, which is $42,785,205, from $2,128,095,497 to $2,170,880,702. Uh, this is the important part. With a mill rate increase of 2.25%, from $13.35 per dollars per thousand to $13.65 per thousand. Uh, so the mill rate's going up 2.25%. That's the important part of that paragraph. Uh, the valuation increase was due to three main factors. Uh, one, new construction, L.L. Bean's new office building, 40 new single family homes in various stages of completion, and miscellaneous construction projects. Two, adjusting inconsistent property valuation factors for consistency and equitability with other similar property types. And three, the assessment of previously omitted parcels and updating and reclassifying property types. As an agent of the state, the town assessor assesses property valuation in accordance with just value, which the law court has interpreted to mean market value. The assessed valuation combined with the annual approved municipal appropriation sets the tax rate. A lot of stuff there to unpack, uh, but it's an informative update. Uh, and lastly, the Freeport Police Department has a few things uh, that I'd like to share, the three things. Uh, firstly, they have an ongoing gun take back initiative. If any citizen has unwanted firearms or ammunition they do not want around their home, they can bring these items to the Freeport Police Department during normal business hours and they'll take them. Uh, second is an ongoing drug take back initiative. Uh, they also have a drug take back box in the lobby of the public safety building uh, which will take back unwanted prescription drugs that are unwanted or unused. And lastly, uh, the police department has a program to assist citizens with relatives who are prone to wander due to dementia, Alzheimer's disease or other medical reasons. Uh, they supply an RF ID transmitter uh, which can then be tracked by member agencies when uh, one of our citizens has gone missing. That is all I have for announcements. Does anybody else have announcements to make? Councillor Pillsbury. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, 
uh, just wanted to share some information from the RSC5 and their staffing needs. Um, on their website, there's a list of open positions, but they include teachers, mm -hmm. ed techs, nurses, custodians, bus drivers, and school nutrition. And they're seeing significant staff shortages that haven't been seen in years and requiring folks like the director of transportation and his assistant are driving buses. If a bus driver calls out sick, uh, their route is gonna have to be canceled. That's, that's how thin the staffing is. So if you're interested or know anybody that might be interested in helping out uh, or applying for one of these jobs, uh, please see the RSU5 website. Thank you. Councilor Egan. Uh, I just want to, just kind of on a lighter note, um, last week Dan and I um, were given the privilege of a, a tour of the new office building that L.O. Bean is just about finished with on Main Street, and it's a, a phenomenal location and, and space inside, and I won't gush about all the things that um, they put into their into their facility, but um, of, of note and worth mentioning is um, the relationship that they had with all of the different trade groups, dozens of trades working in that facility. Um, they had nothing but positive uh, words to say about their encounter with the town in terms of the processing and getting inspections, and in particular, um, really good words to to reflect back to us about our code officer and, and inspection. So that was really nice to hear. Um, they've had nothing but cooperation from the fire department on getting those kinds of inspections done. So it was a really reaffirming point to hear uh, one of our largest uh, commercial um, tenants in, in our community having a great experience with town staff. Are there announcements before we dive into information? <laughs> uh, the uh, energy efficiency um, on Sunday. is coming up on Sunday, and it uh, looks exciting to me. <laughs> to someone who's interested in getting answers to a lot of things, but I think it's a great opportunity for the town to explore energy efficiency and electrification of the community. So I urge anybody who's interested to show up at the high school starting at 10 o'clock, I think. I think. Um, and I, I guess the other thing that's just stunning to me um, that's happened within the last day or so is that uh, one of our uh, most precious assets in our community received a $35 million grant from the federal government um, at Wolf Neck Farm. I mean, that's just stunning to me, um, having been involved in the farm, knowing where they started on this journey towards where they are, um, to, to see how the progress has been. So congratulations to them, to the staff, and everybody who's worked so hard to get this money, and as, I, as Dave Herring said to me, he said, this is a great, great boon to our community. And I said, I encourage you to come and talk to us about how those benefits will, will drop down into, into our town, because I think people think of Wolf Neck as being isolated out there on the end of Wolf Neck Road, and it's not. It's really a lot of people who are working here in, in our town, and a lot of business, but also a lot of opportunities recreationally and intellectually and culturally. So I didn't want to gush about them too much, but they just had a huge win. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Thanks for bringing that up. That was huge. Um, and one other thing that, that showed up in my I inbox. I all that because I didn't have my thing up. No, I think, you, I think you were good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, we have a resident, Susanna Hancock, who's also on our, our school board, who has done a number of pretty interesting things, including spending a couple of weeks up in the Arctic Circle in Svalbard. Uh, and she's coming to speak in Freeport on September 29th at 7 p.m., uh, part of a group called Freeport Speech, which uh, hosts events at the Meeting House Arts Center pretty much next door at, f um, I forget the address, but it's on Main Street in the old church on Main Street, about two doors down from here. Uh, that's September 29th at 7 o'clock. Um, I think that will bound to be pretty interesting. Uh, other announcements? Uh, next up, we have information exchange, which is similar to announcements, but it's a chance for councillors to exchange information about various council or committees and board meetings and other th goings on. So, Councillor Pillsbury. Uh, just report on uh, Winslow Park Committee. Um, had a meeting, they had an excellent summer, um, incredible occupancy rate, um, virtually booked up the entire summer. Revenue projections are going to be higher than past years, which is really encouraging. Um, they have the ramp in, uh, the accessible ramp, and um, they're working on getting the uh, two accessible spots paved in the fall, and the playground replacement uh, looking to be on schedule for the spring of next year. 
Other items of information exchange? I have a couple to give you guys time to think if anything comes up. Um, I have two. One is uh, Councillor Daniele and I met with the Conservation Commission and the New England Mountain Bike Association um, along with the Freeport Conservation Trust and the town manager was there and Tony from the chamber was there uh, to talk about the progress of mountain bike trails at Hedgehog Mountain. Uh, things are still moving forward. The commission is still working on their study of species and, and wildlife and plants. Uh, which they expect to complete in December uh, on schedule. Uh, the conversation did take a, a turn into realizing that it's really part of a bigger project. So uh, yes, we might get mountain bike trails at Hedgehog Mountain, but how does that connect into getting a path over to the new highway bridge and then getting a path over to Hunter Road Fields, uh, maybe using some facilities that are already at Hunter Road Fields uh, and being able to bike really in a circle all around town so you can, uh, over time, bike up here from Portland and in bike paths or off-road, hit downtown, spend some money, spend some time, bike around, uh, hit the mountain bike trails, and then come back to downtown and stay here. So it's, it's a pretty interesting vision. And a lot of that is work that's already underway, so it's not like they're new initiatives with new funding requirements. It's their trails that are already being planned, and, and they just realize that it's, it's really a piece of that. So anyway, it's still coming, hoping to get some construction started next year if all goes well. Uh, but they still have to, to raise some money because the project is, is expensive. Um, and then secondly, I met uh, just last night with the Police Advisory Committee. Um, and two things of note, one is they're sending out surveys, one internal to the police department, uh, asking the officers what they think uh, about the department, how things are going, what needs to change, if anything. And there'll be a similar survey offered to the public, if the public has any input about how the police department is doing and if anything needs to change. Um, so look for that uh, next month in October. I'll probably announce that on Public Safety Day, which I believe is October 12th, but I'm sure that'll be a future announcement. Uh, and they also have just posted the uh, Social Services Liaison position, which we had talked about. Uh, so that'll be a new position in the police department uh, to help deal with uh, calls that they go on that might not be of a criminal or safety or security kind of a, a police call, but just somebody who needs some help being connected to social services. Um, so that's a pretty exciting opportunity. They expect a lot of interest in that. Um, so hopefully we'll fill that position pretty soon. That's all I have. Anything else? Okay. Moving on, we're already on our fifth order of business, which is the town manager's report. Mr. Manager. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we can cut a little bit short because uh, you've done some great announcements on what I had kind of originally asked to talk about on the, uh, or planned to talk about, not asked, uh, on the tax commitment process. I do want to point out a couple things. Um, uh, one, it, it went very smoothly. This is our tax assessor's first uh, commitment by himself. He's done a couple of it in his previous jobs, but he did a fantastic job so far. There's still more to, you know, there's a longer process involved. Um, the, the few little key points here that I'd like to point out, um, you announced accurately it's a 2.25% tax rate increase. Um, and for inf uh, reference, inflation in that time period roughly 7.5%, 7.6 to 7.4, depending on which month you measure from. So utilizing the CPI, so that's important. I think a lot of our, you know, we had a lot of discussion during the budget process about are we spending too much, are we spending too little, um, and the tax rate still came down pretty significantly lower than inflation, which I'm really happy with. Um, I also did a couple brief comparisons here that I'm gonna see if they make it up on the screen. Hold on. Um, close enough. Of course, we can't see it because, um, hold on. All right, we can do better here. So important to note, um, these are using the 22 rates for the towns that have declared them in our immediate vicinity, the 21 uh, annual rates for those that have not because we are not at the point where municipalities have to go through the commitment yet until November. So Falmouth and Yarmouth aren't there yet, which is perfectly fine. Um, also, keeping in mind that over here where it says the equalized percentage, not every uh, community equalizes to 100% every year, which is perfectly fine as well, unless you get down into the 70, below 70 or above 110, you're fine. Um, we're at 100 right now. 
but uh, the declared certified rates can be within 10% of the actual state equalized percent. So there's some wiggle room of about 10% in these numbers over in this column. That's the most important thing to take away that I calculated, extrapolated out based on their equalization percentage times their declared rate. So for a town that's at 100% equalization like Freeport, 1365, the tax rate is the actual tax rate. So if you have the same value of house in Freeport in Portland, you can expect within four cents to be paying the same tax bill because um, they're both equalized at 100%. This column here equalizes all those tax rates for you. These are not, I've got a disclaimer on this above, the version I handed out, these are not the declared rates that the municipalities have established. These are just their declared rates times the equalization percentage. So just for whoever's watching, just to understand that. But I do wanna point out that it still puts us, um, I did coastal Cumberland County and a few of our inland neighbors from, uh, from Scarborough to Brunswick, which is generally kind of our comparable catchment area, does put us near the lowest of the equalized tax rates, uh, but there's a whole good chunk of us in the you know, 15 and sub range. Um, but that's ranked from lowest, 100% equalized to highest right there. And I've got our RSU five neighbors here as well, but they're not, um, based on the information they had online. They've got contracted agents. I couldn't get that timely. Um, Pownell's 2022 rate, I don't know their equalization percentage, and Durham's 100% equalized rate is from 2020, the most recent one. And these highlighted ones here are the ones that have not gone through their 2022 commitment yet, so these are their equalized rates from last year. So um, we get the comment a lot, Freeport has high taxes, highest taxes in the region. Um, True. Yeah, it's actually the polar opposite of that. I understand our taxes, taxes are high, I pay them, we all pay them. Um, this isn't meant to be like taxes are great, we should all be happy about taxes, but just showing where we fall in the range of our neighboring communities. Um, and just a really brief one here. Um, I don't know, most don't even need to put it up, it's our tax rate history for 10 years and it's basically a straight line, so um, I won't spend too much time getting that. This is 2020, this is 2012 or 2013, and this is 2022 over on the right. So as house values have gone up, tax rates have declined a little bit, but basically stayed pretty flat, which is what most of those towns that I showed you on the first page, uh, it's pretty consistent. They, most of the communities around here are staying relatively flat. So um, that being said, I just wanna give a shout out to our assessor who completed this process timely. Um, Happy with how it went so far, but there's still a lot more work to be done with uh, appeal process and things like that. So he's he's most of the way through. But um, in other great news, uh, cooperative news, uh, we worked with Yarmouth. So specifically, uh, myself, the Yarmouth town manager, the, our planning department staff, and their economic development staff um, worked on jointly submitting a grant application to the governor's office of, uh, I'm gonna get it wrong, Policy innovation in the future, otherwise referred to as GoPIF, um, in the amount of $121,000 to jointly fund for 15, up for at least 15 months, possibly longer, a joint sustainability position. We talked about that with the council. We expect to hear back in October, um, but Caroline, Cecilia from our staff and uh, Scott from Yarmouth staff did a lot of the legwork on developing the grant. We do have a job uh, description that's waiting for some favorable indication that the grant will be awarded and then we will put that out to add. So we're not wasting any time on that, but we are waiting probably for about a month to a month and a half to hear back from the state for, at this point forward. So they're on board, they're excited, which is great. And we've kind of got some of the details. The staff will be living here most of the time, but we'll be commuting back and forth on different days. Um, we talked about the nighttime kind of what committees are expected in each town and things like that. So it sounds like a pretty good fit for at least the short term for a shared position. Uh, I'll update you when we hear more on the grant. And I absolutely, the next item, I do not mean to rub it into RSU 5's uh, open wounds about staffing, but um, their problems have come much later than ours. I'm really excited at this time that we are almost fully staffed with the exception of one position, which is almost 180 degrees um, from last year. We hired over 13 full-time people over the past year uh, due to turnover. Most of this stemming from changes that people made during the pandemic, you know, the, that two-year period um, now until about two years ago. Um, we have one existing full-time position that's open. That's a police officer that's open due to a retirement um, that they're hiring for. 
we do have three um, positions. Uh, the council chair talked about them, the social service liaison position for the police department, which we're excited about, and we've got some full-time firefighter EMT medic positions and supervisors positions at the fire department. We've got two of those that we are um, looking to fill. Those aren't new positions, but they're conversion from part-time and per diem staff to full-time positions that we went through in the budget. We also have a couple more that will be coming up. One is the sustainability position I just talked about. Uh, another is an open position, the uh, zoning administrator that is still was not successfully filled in the spring. We're reworking the job description and the uh, advertisement on that. We've been working with a couple of people and that will go out probably in the next month or so. So we will have essentially five newish um, positions to fill, but only one existing staff. And everybody looked at me with like daggers when I was talking about this today at the office down my side of the building because they're like, you know, we're going to have like three resignations in the next week because you say that. It's just a jinx. So um, we haven't had any in a long time. People are very happy from an employment perspective, but it's been a lot of hard work on uh, Judy, our HR director, myself, and a lot of the department heads to keep those positions full. So really happy we're okay, at least going into the winter season at least. Are, are we so. still looking for somebody in public works? We are not. Oh, great. They're, they're fully staffed. There is a halftime position that is open um, that was used to be shared with RSU 5 that I don't believe that they're filling because I think RSU 5 has much bigger things to worry about in their maintenance and bus driving staffs and things like that. So um, we're just going to probably eat that until they're at the point. That was a winter position that we had that they would do summertime work on fields maintenance. So when they're ready, uh, when they're not digging themselves out, we'll go back to them and probably that position will continue, but just it doesn't need to happen right now from you know, a prioritization standpoint, we don't need to burden them with that. Council Pillsbury. That's really great news. Congratulations. And I know hiring is really tough. So can, thank you to the staff that did all the work. Um, and this is a really good thing for the town because now we don't have to worry about things sort of falling through the cracks because we have open positions. So some of them are in the room. So thank you. Thank you. Paul's been hiring a couple of people. I know our fire chief Courtney, our library director is back there. She's had a couple uh, over the past year. So every department's had it. We've just been trying to fill positions. And I think all of our department heads have done a good job that have done that. Thanks to you and the other four or five of your colleagues, uh, our teammates that have that have done that. It's been great. So thanks, Councillor. Yep. Um, last but not least, a really quick one. Uh, we were asked to look at myself, but myself and the town clerk to look at the last council meeting um, wording for the adoption, setting of public hearings. Councillor Fournier brought it up. Um, the second paragraph that says usually says be it further order that copies be distributed then with the list of where they go and how they're available for inspection um, so we looked at that our town clerk had done talking Chris uh, over in the corner hi Chris uh, had done some research gotten a little bit of a legal opinion we looked through our ordinances I looked through our ordinances again um, all of those things are required by our ordinances in our charter um, it doesn't require the council to say them. We have to do them anyways. Um, I think there is a little bit of value there that it's like clarifying what the council expects to happen, but there's no requirement there at all. I think it would only be a problem if people stop doing that, like on the clerk's end, my end, or you know whoever on the library's end who's has the copies available for inspection, AKA a computer terminal with the town website where you can pull them up to view. Um, so that's, I'll, I'll leave that back in the council's uh, lap if you don't like it and we don't want to put that in future orders. Um, John and Dan and I look at the agenda each two weeks so we can leave that off if the council wishes or I don't think you need to make a decision now, but it's, that's the answer. It doesn't have to be there from what we were told. And that's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any questions for the manager? All right, uh, now it's the public's turn. Our sixth order of business at every meeting is our public comment period, uh, which we have 30 minutes allocated for. Um, and I'd be delighted if we had 30 minutes worth of public comment. I'm guessing we might not, but uh, if you have anything that you wanna talk about that's not already on our agenda, uh, this is the time. If you do have something to say, step up to the podium so we, we can capture your, your audio, uh, introduce yourself, um, and tell us what you want to talk about. Um, I'll kill a little time in case there are people here who are shy or 
Need a little time to get to the microphone. Who want to raise their hand on Zoom? If you're at home, you can do that. I've only got one person on Zoom with no hands. No so. hands. Okay. So I'll try Councillor Egan's trick and saying we're about to turn the microphone off and see if anybody pops up. <laughs> Not seeing none. Uh, we'll move on uh, to the seventh order of business where all the fun happens. Uh, these are all of our orders for the night. Uh, the first of which is item 174-22, uh, which is regarding our consent agenda, uh, which tonight just has appointments for our town boards and committees. There are nine appointments tonight for six different committees and boards. So does anybody have any reason why we should take any of these appointments off of the consent agenda and discuss them individually? If not, I would move that we... Uh, uh, move be it ordered that the September 20, 2022 consent agenda be adopted. Second. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lawrence. <coughs> Any questions, discussions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Everybody, thank you. Um, next up is item 175 22, the first of a few public hearings that we have, too many to count. Uh, and this one is about uh, the first two, actually, are about, both about the bake shop. Uh, which Bake Shop LLC, which is uh, due to open at 123 Main Street, which is the old Azure Cafe building. Uh, so tonight we have a public hearing regarding a, first up is a liquor license. So Council Pillsbury, would you do the honors of opening the public hearing? I make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. Thank you, Councilor Lawrence. Uh, so we now have a public hearing. So if anybody wants to talk about the proposed liquor license application for the Bake Shop LLC located at 123 Main Street, now would be a fine time. Uh, I'd also invite the, the applicants to come up if they do want to say a few words about what is going into the, the shop and what we can expect. Feel free. Uh, if you don't have to, that's fine. We have your permit application, so we've read that, but mm -hmm. you're welcome to say anything if you'd like. Uh, yeah, <laughs> come on up. Sure. Early free advertising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Hi. Um, uh, the microphone. Oh, it's good. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, so, unfortunately, my wife couldn't come today. She's the executive chef, so she can speak more to the food. Uh, it is a wife uh, and husband business. Um, as you said, we're going to take over the space that Azure once had. Um, bake shop. We're going to have baked goods. We're going to have sandwiches, salads, soups, um, an array of uh, to-go mostly. And we've got the nice patio out there so people can get something to go and spend some time on the patio. Uh, we will have some seating inside. Um, yeah, so, and we're looking to, we, our primary business that we've had for the last 16 years is catering. Uh, we did a while back have uh, a shop on Main Street in Brunswick. Uh, and then we just moved into catering and, and had that offsite um, but now we've decided to open back up. Uh, so there'll be some catering out of the same space and there'll be the bake shop also. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, all the above? Yeah, I mean, so my wife's vision is that it could be open from possibly, and I don't want to hold anybody to this, but it could be nine to nine. So there's a wide range of things that will be, you could have throughout the day. Um, and uh, again, mostly things to go. Um, but obviously, we're here for the, light, the permits or licenses that we're here. There will be a, an array of drinks that, that people can have uh, to select from and uh, an array of food, too. That's Ian. Uh, my name is Ian Talmadge, spelled I-A-N, and last name Talmadge, T-A-L-M-A-G-E. Ian, is the uh, catering business going to also go by the bake shop, LLC? Nope. Uh, the catering business is what our current business is called, 111 Main Catering. And um, we're going to be able to utilize the space also for doing some catering out of there. Um, we primarily do wedding catering, though we do some event catering. Um, we had been doing it. We, uh, it was sort of an at-home business uh, in Topsom, where we're based. Uh, and uh, we've been doing that for quite a while. We need a little bit more space. Uh, but again, we're mostly seasonal. So. Right. so welcome okay. to Main Street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Welcome. welcome to a different Main Street. Yeah. yeah. So there's going to be 111 Main operating out of 123 Main. Yeah, yeah. No, we like that, the change from 111 to 123. Awesome. Well, I'm a big fan of baked goods, so <clears throat> excited. Yeah, and, and gluten-free oh, yeah, options. Gluten-free options. So it'll be Workshop coming up Jennifer's soon. gluten-free. Yeah. So <laughs> I think we need to, to plan one, yeah. Yeah, Councilor Bradley. Hi. Um, 
<clears throat> probably none of my business, but did, do you have a long-term lease? Are you there? Yes, we do. We do. No, we have a long-term lease um, and uh, with extensions. Um, we are invested to stay. Um, I could say minimum right now five years, but we'll go beyond that. And you're doing a bunch of renovations to the space, right? Yeah, mostly a lot of aesthetic. It's been, uh, I think that as you was there for, let's say, nine, 17 years maybe or so. So some ceiling tiles need to go. You know, mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of uh, yeah. just, you know, clean up, repaint, uh, you know, a new face. How was the process in permitting with the town? Any significant issues? Or? We talked about that in the beginning portion, and I think a lot of it's just aesthetic things. So um, as we keep moving along, again, this is our busiest season uh, for wedding and catering. I just did five events this past weekend, and I've got three next weekend. So we're not moving as quickly as maybe I know people come by and they see that the sign has just been put up. We just got that. Uh, and a lot of people asking, when are you opening? What are you going to do? So we're hoping uh, this fall and let's just say before um, Halloween is what we're shooting for. So great. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think they had much um, restaurant to restaurant. Um, right. So right now the change of use. A little bit of building. Yeah, I think we're just kind of staying here. maybe more to go than dine in. We're not really going to do table service, but we do have food to go. If you do make it open by Halloween, a lot of the storefronts offer candy to people who oh, walk yeah, down I Main Street, that. just so you know, and you're not caught by surprise. Yeah. Not that I'm advocating for free candy, but. Baked good candies, I don't know. Well, yeah. No, I want my candy. All right, uh, we're still in a public hearing, so does anybody else from the public uh, in the room or on Zoom? It looks like our Zoom audience has dwindled, but uh, anybody else have anything to offer about the Bake Shop liquor license? You do not have a Zoom audience. So, um, Still the person. You're still out there on the interwebs, but just not yeah, on Zoom. Just not so. that popular tonight. Yep. Councillor Pillsbury, would, would you like to close the public hearing? I uh, make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Uh, thank you, Councillor Lawrence. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Councillor Pillsbury, would you want to read the beat ordered? Uh, beat ordered that a new liquor license application for the Bake Shop LLC located at 123 Main Street be approved. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Any further discussion? All in favor of the liquor license. Aye. 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 Okay, that's everyone. Uh, so we know, congratulations on your liquor license. Uh, don't go anywhere. Our next item is 176-22 to consider a new special amusement permit for the Bake Shop LLC located at 123 Main Street. Council Fournier, would you like to open this public hearing? Sure. Motion to open public hearing. Second. Thank you, Councilor Bradley. Uh, again, if there's anybody from the public who wants to talk about the bake shop's uh, special amusement permit, now is the time. There's nobody on Zoom, so I'll just look to the room. Seeing the same group in the room. Uh, doesn't some, seem like we have any takers for our public hearing. Councillor Fournier, would you like to close? close public hearing. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Uh, and Councillor Fournier, back to you one more time. Yes, be in order. A new special amusement permit for the bake shop. LLC located at 123 Main Street be approved. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Any further discussion at the Council? All in favor of the special amusement permit? Aye. Aye. Councillor Bradley, yeah, there's an aye. Okay, uh, that's six to zero. So congratulations on your special amusement permit. Good luck. We look forward to seeing you on Main Street before Halloween if, if, if it works out. Hold them to it. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to show up on Halloween, ask for free candy one way or another. <laughs> maybe it'll be open, maybe you won't be. Uh, I think we're going to put you on the uh, egg buying watch list from the comments over there. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, we have some zoning. Uh, item 177 22 regarding amendments to the Freeport zoning ordinance regarding uh, parking, basically. Uh, so we have a public hearing. Uh, we also have, I think, an introduction from our town planner who's getting set up. Do you need help? People like it when I go fast. So uh, we could certainly open the public hearing, and then Caroline can give her intro during the public hearing. So we'll take care of that. So go ahead anytime you're ready, Councilor Lawrence. Motion to open the public hearing. Second. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. All in favor of opening the public hearing, right. six to zero. We're in a public hearing, which will start by inviting the town planner.
Caroline Pelletier, I think, is ready now to introduce the topic, and then we can take any other public comment. So what I'm going to give you tonight is a crash course in parking. I learn something new every day. I've been studying for 20 years. <laughs> um, and then we'll walk through what the planning board is recommending to you. Um, so tonight we're talking about parking for multifamily residential. In the land use world, multifamily residential is something specific. It's three or more dwelling units. So typically apartment building, condos, something like that. Yep. Um, and so village commercial one, here on the left you have a map outlining the village commercial one. You're all familiar with it. We just did a whole downtown visioning plan. It's really, you know, the heart of Freeport um, and the downtown. On the map you can see some shading. The shading represents some of the existing residential units we have downtown. We do have some. We don't have a lot. You can see that they're mostly on the outskirts. We have some mixed use. We have some that have multiple units in a building. And then we have about 10 or so single family. Permitted today would be multiple family dwellings. Again, a building with three or more units. Mixed use development, which you've added, clarified in the past couple years when you have any number of residential and commercial units in one structure. And then we don't permit new single families as a permitted use in the village, but we did make it, or you guys made it a couple years ago, so that existing single family homes are allowed to be considered legally existing and it gives them like expansion provisions and stuff like that. So in 2001, um, we worked with FEDC. Peter's telling me 2020. We can fight about it later. Oh, 2021. Um, we worked with FEDC, the planning board, and the council to remove some initial barriers to development. Um, if you were on the council at that time, you'll remember that we changed building height from a 35 feet and we converted it to three stories up to 45 feet. And then we also have something called the land per dwelling unit. In most districts, you have to have so much land area per unit that you have. And so that was removed. So in the village, you can, if you can meet all the other standards or pieces of the puzzle, you don't have a minimum land area per dwelling unit. And then obviously in 2022, we just completed the downtown vision plan. Too fast or we good? Good? Okay. <laughs> so existing parking, this looks familiar. It was from the downtown vision plan. We've had various maps like this over the years. The redder buildings, the grayer parking. We have about 3,000, we call them off-street parking, um, 3,000 off-street parking spaces in downtown Freeport. Does that count in the garages? That, yes, that includes the parking garage, which has a little over 500, and then the rest are surface spaces. And again, that's just in the boundaries of that village commercial one. So parking in Freeport. Um, Freeport's unique in many different ways. Um, I'm gonna use the M word, which I hate when people use that in Freeport. People say Freeport's like a mall. The only way we're like a mall is that we have a whole bunch of different stores in one location and people love to come here and spend the day. We now have a lot more than just stores, but we have a whole bunch of different businesses in one central location, many of which historically include shopping. If you go to a mall, you typically have one property owner one big building and a whole bunch of parking lots. Well, here in Freeport, we're not set up like that. We have a whole bunch of buildings, a whole bunch of parking lots, and there's property lines going everywhere underneath. You just don't see them. Um, so back in the 80s, Freeport moved to this concept of shared parking. And so what that meant is that you could come to Freeport, you could park at Daryl's store, but then you could park at Chip's store, you could park at Ed's store, you could park at John's store, would all share, you wouldn't have to move your car, and you could spend the day. We incentivize this by having a lower parking requirement for people that participated in shared parking. And if you go around town, you know there's a handful, if even, of places that are signed. Otherwise, you can pretty much park wherever you want and spend the day. So the off-street parking requirements have changed over the years. They've fluctuated you know, based upon use based on location, if you wanted to share, if you didn't want to share. So in the early 90s, the town developed lease parking standards, and that was a way you could meet your parking requirement if you couldn't fit it on site. In the early 2000s, we made a step further and said, 
you can meet that parking with lease parking anywhere in that village commercial one district. So you could have your business here and your parking could be on the other side of the district. We've continued to amend parking standards over time, specifically to encourage things. For example, there is no parking requirement for religious institutions. We've exempted art center indoor movie theater when it's connected to a parking garage. So there's been different things that we've removed parking requirements for. Most recently in 2018, the town of Freeport Planning Board and Council made significant changes to the parking requirement. The biggest changes were A, the way we calculate building area, and then B, lowering the parking requirement for many uses. Everybody involved in the decision making process at that point knew that this would lower parking requirements, essentially freeing up land for development. The regulations were designed in a way that allowed business owners to come in and get their parking recalculated. So if you built, you know, back in 1995, and your requirement was one thing and it would be lower, you could come in, provide me with all the detail that he needed, and sign off and your parking would be lower. Thereby there'd be parking that you wouldn't need. So now we're in 2022. We haven't seen a lot of redevelopment um, until, you know, the past few months. One important thing to remember with all these changes, which I summarized in one slide, you know, for 20 years is that we've had different standards for different uses and different things over time. So somebody that comes in today has one standard. There could be people that open businesses before zoning. They could be providing no parking. There could be businesses that came in in between and providing, you know, just a portion. So historically, when we've talked about this, there's been a lot of emotion and a lot of background in the history because everyone's contributing a different amount and some people feel like they're paying for other people to have parking. Um, so I'd say I think the planning board is pretty sensitive, knowing the history and our situation in their deliberation. Um, so one of the planning board members is like, okay, so you're saying like someone has a business here, but they have parking over there. It's like, yep, that's exactly what I'm telling you. So on the left here, we're not gonna, I'll only point out one of the property owners. You have this color, color mask. So you're like, what is that, Caroline? This just shows you kind of the relation. So for example, the blue. Anything you see in blue is owned by the town of Freeport. You can see we have some buildings different places, we have parking different places. This is just really to show you, it's all spread out and it's that way for a lot of property owners. So property owners already have, you know, look at the light yellow. They have buildings in certain places and parking in other places. It's not all pretty on one lot nor is it what everyone always says or I read in the paper, town parking. You know, a lot of this is not owned by the town of Freeport. So here's a little snapshot. Again, we talked, we have about 3,000 off-street parking spaces, parking lots or garages. Of that, the town of Freeport only owns about 250 of them. The rest are privately owned by different organizations or private property owners. Due to the changes in 2018 and the parties that have come forward and requested parking changes, we have about 500 parking spaces, that's actually a little bit over, that are sitting there on the face of the earth and not meeting a parking requirement. People have chosen to keep the lots there, they've chosen to keep them open, but really, they didn't have to because they've met their requirement elsewhere. And then we also have this shared parking pool that we talked a little bit about. So one of the questions we got during the planning board process, what's in that pool? So the town of Freeport, for example, we have owned more parking spaces then we need to meet the minimum requirement. We could just do nothing, or we could enter them into the lease parking pool. So the lease parking pool, there's different things you do to enter your spaces. You have to maintain them, light them, plow them, all that stuff, but you can then offer them to lease for other people. So if somebody comes in, starts a business, they don't wanna build parking or don't have parking, they can lease parking. So the last two bullets here, the 500 surplus, those people have not chosen at this point in time to put them into lease parking. So we have the 500 spaces sitting on the earth and then we have another 184 that people didn't need but chose to put in lease parking. Can Question? Show us where they are? Where are the 500? Are they all spotted all over the place? That's really, a, that's a good question. They could be spotted all over the place because you have to show us that you meet your requirement but we don't say that space outside here is going for town hall. That space here is going to LLB. We kind of lump it all together. So you kind of have flexibility in a way. 
Presumably the 500 strip of spaces occupy, uh, take up land that could be developed. Yes. But we don't know where that development land is. There's a few examples that are. Yeah, I mean, so. We can use the ones that are currently proposed. The green parking lot there that's next to the white, uh, to the These down in the left of the village okay. station, the white buildings, the three white buildings you see in the kind of center right, mm -hmm. that green blob, or rectangle, angled rectangle to the dead left of that, mm -hmm. that's owned by L.L. L. Bean, and it's currently, there's a housing proposal. That's the Depot Street housing proposal that's been in front of the planning board. Those, for example, those parking mm -hmm. spaces, if they were, if that lot was sold, it's under agreement, if that lot were mm -hmm. sold, those spaces would go away, and um, it's safe to say, right, that those would come out of L.L. Bean surplus parking that they have. Yes, yeah, or like, for example, the town of Freeport, like, we, on paper, we meet our parking requirement. We say we have them out here, but we have extra spaces that we control at the community center in Howard Place, so we choose to put those in the parking pool. So I think we've given flexibility to the landowner. We care that they meet it, but, you know, if they say they want to meet it from lots one, two, and three and count for a surplus, as long as they're meeting it, we, we, I think we've been pretty flexible with them. Caroline, you gave an example just a minute ago of someone wanting to open a business and doesn't, they don't want to build or lease parking. They could uh, participate in the shared parking pool. But we've, we've dramatically reduced the parking requirements. Why? why wouldn't the um, business that's opening just say my customers therefore my parking need is going to be met by some small number of the 500 surplus parking spaces it seems a little challenging mm -hmm. to require someone to go out and lease parking spaces when there's 500 empty sitting there with no use other than just sitting there because everybody is doing their share to contribute that minimum requirement to ensure that we have enough parking is here. And by people participating in the pool, it allows, you know, offsets the cost of keeping these things open, lit, striped, paved. Somebody's got to pay for them. Would it be fair to say that if I was the owner of one of the 500 surplus parking spaces, I can make it available in the shared parking pool? If John opens his new store, he could then lease it from that shared parking pool? Yes, I think you could keep them for whatever you want, which clearly some people have, and we've seen, you know, some are under contract to sell, to turn into housing, or you could put them in the lease parking pool. We haven't seen a lot of new development. There hasn't been a demand for the lease parking pool. Yeah. Since I've gone here, the number of leases and the dollar value is, you know. We, we were so certain in 2018 mm -hmm. that the highest and best use of downtown real estate was not a parking spot. But four years later, it's proving that maybe maybe there is something there that because we're not seeing, except for just recently, these two these two parcels, which are going in on one on parking, one on yeah. undeveloped land. Only one of those is in on parking lot. Um, mm -hmm. So that I'm that that's just really curious to me and. Uh, you know, again. I was shocked when the planning board first did this change. I was like, oh, there's going to be like a line out the door. People are going to come in and ask for these recalculations. And we really didn't see that. You know, the small business owners who were ha didn't have parking on site and who were leasing five spaces, they were in right away. But, you know, a lot of our bigger landowners, as we showed here, that have multiple properties and multiple parking lots, they really trickled in and, you know, waited, which I think was surprising. Still haven't recalculated for the town, have we? The town of Freeport has not recalculated. I was looking at that today. You have potential. Here, uh, so let's just take the property that is a potential development site. If we lose that, how many of those 500 surplus spots, what does that do to the surplus? You'd be down to about 400. There's 98 in that parking lot today. Thank you. So we lose that. Um, and I've heard people come to me saying we can't lose the parking because uh, there's no place to park. Now I've seen, to be honest with you, it's nothing like it was in the 80s. Uh, I can remember when both streets were lined. You couldn't get up through me. I haven't seen it that bad, but I have seen, you know, it was backed up here a couple of weekends ago up to Mallard Drive, kind of like it used to be all the way down to Maggie's. But um, uh, we have adequate places, but people aren't going to walk. 
Now, people aren't going to go up on Justin's Way and park down there and walk down. That's just the way it is. I'm included when I'm lazy. So, <laughs> you know, I, have we've got enough parking to absorb those. We hope that, that they'll come back and people are going to have to drive here unless they come on the train or other things. So how are we situated for those which we hope are incurring more businesses to come. Um, so that will be one of my next slides. So one of the things we do here in the planning department is we count parking spaces. A lot of people don't realize that. We've been doing it for years. So we have a select group of lots. It's not a perfect science. Right now there's two of us. Sometimes we have volunteers or interns and we have people help out, but we do walk around and count. And about 15 years ago, I could tell you where you could always find a spot. The patterns have changed. Right now, you can always find a spot in that parking garage. We have yet to see it entirely full. Um, but I do have some. In the center of town. Yeah, center of town. The closest so, to yeah, most of the buildings, yes. I would say in 2000, we've studied parking for years. We have all sorts of studies. I have files and folders. Um, in 2016, we were pretty lucky that we had some interns. So we counted parking like twice a day pretty much every day all summer. We did peak peak days. We don't have that right now. So we have staff go out randomly selecting once a day if we can get help on the weekends. So again, not an exact science, but we do monitor. So here we have, these are lots we've historically tracked, so we keep to track them. We have seen shifts. For example, FCS has a ton of programs. So if you want to park in that small lot down there, years ago you used to build a park, but now you can't. Um, you know, the municipal old lot number four, which is known as Howard Place near the baseball field, a lot of the high school kids like to park there now that that complex has changed. But this kind of gives you a glimpse of what we were seeing for the average vacancy rates. Um, so Middle Street is the parking around CVS. 2016, it was almost 40% vacant every day we counted it. 2021, it was up to 68%. The parking garage, the lower level, went from 53 up to 72. And the upper level, which I believe is the van accessible level, went from 40 to 71%. Um, Howard Place, again, is that one near the high school, went from 40 to 63. And then the Tuscan Bistro, I think, you know, is, seems to be a successful business in Freeport. That was the parking lot back in the day, Daryl. You could always find a spot there, always. <laughs> But yeah, but you know, we, it, that's consistently busy even now. We're counting now still, and it's consistently busy out there comparatively. So these numbers are, reflect what someone saw at, at an instant in time when they were there to inspect the lot? These are the averages. So like we took, you know, if we counted July to December, all the days we took the average percents. Do you have any numbers that show um, maximum? In other words, you don't- Busiest day busiest day so that um, might be more we had a, yeah so we had a count on black friday 2016 and it still wasn't full we haven't seen a day last summer this summer that we were entirely entirely full hundred percent you couldn't park anywhere we just haven't but do you have seen it there are lots like howard place or uh, middle street that were full on some days? Um, not, I don't believe we've seen it the past two years. I'd, I'd have to go through and double check. But back in the day when we used to go out and count, you would see like Howard Place, it would be full, like fairly regularly. We're just, we're not seeing that. But we also have had the parking garage. Well, we also don't count parking on peak events. There's usually like two or three peak events per year, not even yeah. days, like yep. 4th of July at night, if there's a concert, for example, mm -hmm. where there's parking just on shoulders and on the street or uh, like the sparkle parade or like a parade day when Main Street. Yeah, closed. if you want to plan for the, hand, you know, couple days a year where there's peak events, we're just always going to have a sea of parking. That's really what it's going to come down to. There, there are times when we're full, but those are definitely days we're not counting. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, they're becoming fewer. Can you? One, my, one. My experience in this is very limited. And they would yep. calculate the capacity they needed, not based on the vacancy of the transport during the period of time average, but on peak 
and it was that that they built their vessels to and purchased their vessels for. And I, I don't know what the right way to think about parking is, but if you found yourself on a number of days near peak and you need more parking, even though your average might be very low, mm -hmm. We do take them into account, and I think by looking at the parking minimums, you're establishing what you think based upon these businesses you're going to need. You know, we lowered that be in 18 because we felt like we just had too much parking sitting there, and we knew when we lowered it, parking was going to go away, and there might be peak days where we don't have enough. But again, if we want to plan for those couple days a year, then we're going to have what we have today, parking lots. You know, I went through Google Earth, which is really fascinating if you haven't looked at parking on Google Earth, but if you, you know, roll back all the years, like I went back all the way and there were no full parking days in there. That's funny. So with that being said, and, and I'm not sure if it, this will lead that, you know, I'm not sure if we're utilizing our areas of parking to its fullest ability. Mm -hmm. But maybe at some point uh, there needs to be a parking facility, two-story parking garage as an example, that will be located where, number one, it would attract a lot of use, and then we will look back to your previous slide, and I remember Justin's Way was full of housing. Mm -hmm. That was many years ago, but we had housing both sides of that. And, and that housing went away, which was affordable housing. It's back to our early discussion. Uh, and that was all made into parking lot to meet parking requirements for beans at the time, which is adequately shown here. So maybe the discussion we ought to be looking at is Maybe we ought to take some of our properties and, and utilize it for parking to the best use. Maybe by putting a parking garage in and opening other areas for other uses. I don't know. So I would, to follow up on that, I would say, like, if you walk around town, not even counting, I mean, you can clearly tell that the parking lots on the left side of Main Street, if you're going north, are better utilized than the ones on the right. We also know that people like me, I always come and park on Depot Street because I know I can easily get a spot. I'm going to have to change my parking pattern. I'm not going to be able to park there if there's housing. So I'm going to have to go over there, go around. I might have to walk a little further. Um, and then the other thing you might remember from the downtown vision, that was one of the long-term visions they showed. They showed on Howard Place, which is that blue lot back near the baseball diamond. Um, the concept of a parking garage there in the future. But to go to that point, there was when you saw that it was a neat visual. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a great, yeah, magic, creative thought. But because we seem to have so much mm -hmm. excess parking, no one could, I couldn't figure out. No one could hear anybody explain why we would put a parking garage in to meet a need we didn't have when we had so many other ideas we might want to do. That's I think, what, I think. Yeah. what they're saying. What they're saying is that you put the parking garage in so you can use other places to. Right for another purpose like affordable housing? Well, I think in, the first thing we're going to see is it, people have to go in the garage we already have, which right. they're not doing. Right. But, but a 500 you, unit parking garage and then take away 500 unit surface lots, leaving the net parking where it is. I mean, this is just a vision. This isn't some grand plan, but. Oh, but if that's a great chip yeah. and that's a great connection yeah. for me because yeah. I hadn't thought about it that way. But now get to that point. So say you'd build a parking garage. Now you've got a lot of excess parking, but you don't control. Um, that the use of that excess parking because it's privately owned, you know. Right. So, uh, what's the incentive to get that private owner to take his excess parking that you've just created by a parking garage and put it into something else you want, which is affordable housing or something else? I don't know the answers. I just is that we got all the nods here from the people who are running this revisioning. Um, is that sort of in the thinking process? Money, I, I think money? it's money. Yeah, yeah. I think if if you You're can money. Yeah, if you feel like you have sufficient parking and the town's not telling you you have to have more and you can sell a parking lot for some money and it goes to a use that you're comfortable with, why wouldn't you sell it? But if that's, but to go to the affordable housing point, right. the, the, apparently the, the marketplace is not creating incentives enough to produce affordable housing. So if you want to see that happen, that's where you need to have your TIF district or something else that directs that investment in those locations to that purpose. If you want something that's not the market, right? Yeah. Yep. Sorry to take that. Time. No, no, it's. Mm -hmm. I could talk about parking all day, Ed. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of pieces <laughs> that are, are <laughs> meshing, you know. 
so and some mixed signals here from different sides of the council. Well, I'm going to bring it back to where we all started. I said I was going to give you a crash course, and that's exactly what this was. It was 20 years of parking and 10 slides. So just some background information. We've had a whole bunch of studies over the years. We've looked at parking. It's mostly been looked at commercial. There have been recommendations on residential. We haven't done a whole bunch with them other than change it based upon bedrooms, which is problematic in its own way, but save that for another day. Um, we, the planning board, after they made this change, did start looking at changing some standards for residential. That did include parking. It, it didn't go forward for various reasons. As we did the visioning, developers started to call. They were like, wow, Freeport's really interesting. We're interested, we want to do stuff. But your housing, your parking requirement for a multifamily is just adding one more cost. It's crazy. It's a barrier. It's not making it any more affordable. So it was flagged very early on. Um, we're not the first community to look at parking. There's this modern trend in the planning world, which I gave you some background, I won't bore you, but um, the concept of removing parking minimums and letting the market run its course is a modern day thing. Auburn has been cited as kind of a, a leader on this. That makes me totally nervous, but you all know that I'm more cautious. <laughs> um, in the downtown vision plan address parking, you know, Freeport needs to assess the downtown parking requirements allow residential users to share their parking spaces with commercial or retail uses. When you all leave tonight, there's a sea of parking available for someone to park. Um, and then allow the market to define the correct amount of parking required by eliminating minimum parking requirements. Those are pretty ambitious goals. I think you know there's something we can lead towards. I would say the proposal here tonight, which I'll summarize in a couple bullets, is really a compromise and a step in that direction. I think it's incremental. I've heard from people that have said, I don't want to go back to what exactly what you're describing, like parking on side streets. Like there's this fear that we're going to run out of parking because we had run out of parking in the past. You know, now we have a parking garage, but there's definitely that concern. I have businesses saying we're, str we're struggling. We're getting no rent. Our requirements are still too high. You know, there's all sorts of things that the community wants us to look at. So the change before you tonight is one, to clearly define shared parking so that residential uses can participate in the shared parking system. Back in 18, they added a standard for residential shared parking. They didn't very clearly <laughs> define that residences could participate. So allowing residences either to have it on site for their residents only, they could buy a parking lot and say for their residents only, or they could share. They could lease it and use some surface parking that's already there. Um, allow the parking requirement, kind of supporting what the vision said, to be met with shared and non-shared. The two developers we have now, they said, hey, no matter what your requirement is, you're going to have a minimum, but we're going to build some parking. We know that people like to drive. We don't want to walk everywhere, especially if we have kids and groceries. You know, We want to be able to park close. So they both want to have some parking on site. Uh, there is a lot of consideration for what the appropriate number should be. Uh, based upon public comment at the meeting, the planning board actually went lower than what they were originally considering. Um, this would convert to a per unit calculation. So if you wanted to do shared parking, you would provide 0.75 parking spaces per unit. Um, and if you didn't want to share, they still want to incentivize, um, you'd have a higher requirement at one space per unit. Um, so I gave you these really simple examples that you can multiply and make work. Um, these are just hypothetical so you can see the, the differences. So, you know, a lot of the multifamily, or at least the ones we're seeing now, are mostly one or one and two bedroom, or efficiency, which we would just call one bedroom. So if someone came in with a one bedroom unit today and wanted to do shared parking, they'd have to have 24 spaces. The proposal, they'd only have to have 15. For a non-shared, they would have to have 40, and it would basically put it in half for 20. Um, the biggest change, one of the biggest changes, is if they want to do shared, right now they could go off the bedroom count. This is just going to really try to simplify it and go off the unit count. If they wanted to do a combination of shared and not shared, you know, have some off-site, but you know they're short a couple, get them in a lot that's already there. Obviously, the numbers would fall somewhere in between. Um, 
And then this was kind of the motion that the planning board made. Like a lot of thought went into it and the benefits. Um, so they felt that the recommendations consistent with the comp plan of recommending or replicating traditional patterns of New England <coughs> development. It would help allow for a variety of neighborhoods and housing types, more flexible regulation to minimize negative environmental impacts. We're in the urban impaired watershed here, so all this parking <coughs> drains into there. Improving walkability, promoting alternatives to the automobile, positive impact to the economic decline that we've seen downtown, and encourage more development to have more people live, work, and play in the community. That being said, um, you know, they were cautious. They said this is something that we need to revisit as a community. We need to monitor it. it could have impacts and we didn't want the impacts to go too far you know I again I think this is incremental and we need to look at it I also think if we look at it we need to look at the whole picture the next time we do we need to look at our on-street parking which is probably other underutilized and then we can look at you know the off street and whether or not we should lower it I've had businesses say we should lower it and my response has been I, we should look at it I don't feel like now's the time we, we did it four years ago and we haven't seen the impacts like the parking sat there like this is the first time we might see a change so that's a snapshot happy to answer any questions that you guys have so uh, i'm just trying to get my mind around i'm just starting to understand <laughs> it's a, a lot little better. Um, <laughs> so we're we're basically reducing the number of spaces that a development would need okay and the fear then is i mean i get the benefits they're they're up there yeah the, they're monitoring it though because they're, the concern is that you might bring in more cars than you have spaces for by lowering those standards. The combination of bringing in cars and then removing some of that surface parking at the same time. I mean, the hope is by people living in the village, you're gonna have people that are gonna bike, they're gonna walk, they're gonna you know, We're use those cars, methods, so give me, but give me cars. yeah, balancing. If we bring in cars and we take away some parking lots, we don't want to run out and be back where we were. So the fear is by it's a, you're adding cars and at the same time you're making surface area excess to parking, which might be used for things other than parking. So that it could be a double whammy, and that's what they're watching for. Yes. Yep. Um, I, I agree that those are exactly the dynamics, I guess, but looking at the statistics that you had mm -hmm. up earlier, we have 500 surplus spots and we have 70% average vacancy in a parking garage, which is in the dead center of town. I think it's a long time before we actually run out of parking. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember uh, during the visioning process when the uh, uh, Russ from the principal group said, a healthy community has a little bit of tension on parking, not a lot, you don't want to have, you don't want to have a, a nightmare where that's all anybody talks about on their drive home is how horrible the parking scene was. But at this point in Freeport, we have a, a, a enormous surplus of parking, and that the the healthiest community is somewhere between those two. And um, so I'm, I would I would like to encourage a little bit more aggressive, but I'm perfectly fine with these suggestions because I think. Um, your statement about taking this a, a, a step at a time and that we examine it in a year or 18 months and see what the what the outcomes are is um, is, is a, a prudent step forward and I think we need to be addressing it now. Councillor Pillsbury first and then Councillor Bradley. You're the one who actually gets to vote so you guys should talk first. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, so what happens if we do revisit this in a year and we make an adjustment, what happens to the developments that are already brought in under this new requirement? I mean, doesn't that create some tension that, I mean, is this, I feel like this is one of those things that, yes, we can say, let's revisit it, but there'll be consequences to that as well. And then we'll have people that might be upset that they're treated one way and a new development isn't. I, I just don't know what the answer is to that. I would say anytime we talk about parking, somebody always gets upset. <laughs> It, it, it is what it is. Um, we have a lot of people that are non-conforming. If we were to up the requirements, say we said, okay, everyone needs two spaces per unit, all of these people would then become legally non-conforming, which again, we talked about, we have a lot of people. If we lowered it, they could, if they're leasing, they could try to negotiate to get out of their lease. That's what people did the last time. 
Um, they could also be like, oh, well, I had to build these spots on my lot, and now they're there. And that's true. But like I said, the two projects we have before Project Review Board right now, they both said they wanted some on site. Um, so those, I think, would be you know, the impacts that we see any time we change zoning. Councillor Bradley and then Councillor Fournier. Um, <clears throat> close to what um, Matt is asking, so you, you do this and the consequences that you described are possible occur. Um, we see more cars coming in and we see land area directed in other uses and all of a sudden you or the planning board decides, discovers that we are short of parking. Where's our flexibility? I mean, in other words, the land is gone, the cars are here, and is, it, is that when the parking, the pressure to build a parking garage becomes intense? Somebody's waiting to speak, Peter. <laughs> so, to my exact point, I, I got two points. I'll start with the second one. Our free shared parking system, I know that that's held by many to be it's going to continue forever in Freeport. Nothing that is in that shared free parking system prohibits somebody from building a for-profit parking lot or garage. So letting the market decide how much parking is necessary. I'm not saying we eliminate all of our parking and turn it all into paid parking because a lot of people, a lot of identities in Freeport brand businesses, things like that are built around the opposite of that. But it wouldn't take, it wouldn't prohibit somebody from taking an existing shared parking lot building a garage three stories and charging somebody X dollars an hour that would justify the cost of the garage if there wasn't parking in town and, and there was a demand for it. So it would allow us to move in that direction slowly if the demand ever materialized. Uh, I, I, some people think it should go completely in that direction, but I don't think that that is ever going to work, at least not with the kind of, I would say, some of the expectations, business expectations, community expectations that parking is free in town, or at least there's free parking available in town. The, other, the only other point that I wanted to make is a lot of the um, offset in timing of demand with residential from peak retail versus peak residential. Um, you're, you see, like go out right now and look and everybody that's, that would be living in potential units that are built would be parking in the empty lots that are there now. So it's a really good shared parking. There are a few crunch times, 8 a.m., 5 p.m., where people still might be out shopping and people might be coming home at 4. Um, you know, it does create some friction, but the bulk of the time that cars are going to be sitting there while you're sleeping, there's no other commercial demand for the space. And people get up, the bulk of people get up to go to work at between 7 and 9 and leave, and the business is open at 10. So weekends are, can be a little hectic, holidays, things like that. But, but those are the only two things I wanted to say. Yeah. So the question I, I have, and I'm not sure how we can answer this. So we build these apartments. I'm a two-family car, uh, two cars in my family, and it's just me and my wife. So I would imagine if a couple comes in, unless they're working in the town, which uh, right now we have some limited jobs, but they're retail, they're not what we call good paying jobs that are available in other communities of Brunswick, Lewiston, and Auburn, Portland, whatever. So the majority, probably the apartments coming here are gonna probably have two vehicles. I think that's up for great debate. Everyone you know, has a different I, I, opinion I, I, on it. <laughs> This is an my son has one car. His wife works that way, and he works that way. He rides his bike to work, and they can do that. But but I, that's and just people, people are taking been, the bus. And there's Everyone also, in the family has had a car, and now there he's down. To, I'm like, what are you doing? You don't you need to? But there's also there's, between one to two thousand jobs that are coming back to right down here in the next six months that we've heard. Right. So what if a, what if a couple that one works in Portland or Auburn or further, and the other one work. They live in Portland now, but the other one works at Bean Corporate, and they want to move to one of these new apartments where they can. Maybe somebody does bike, and they don't need it because five days a week, they're walking a quarter mile to that office complex. So, so, so here's my concern: if if we go with the, with this parking uh, as proposed, which I think we need to address parking. Don't get me wrong, but. So if we build these apartment buildings and the majority of the apartment buildings have two vehicles, we're now adding, <laughs> oh, you know, probably, uh, I don't know how many apartment buildings we're talking, we're, we're talking probably, what, 75 vehicles, so potentially? I mean, I think there's different ways it could work out. So really, the, the point of the planning board looking at this was 
to encourage multifamily. We heard the vision, we want multifamily, we know this is a barrier, that was the point. We also know that the 500 surface spaces that are surplus, that was done in the past. So we're not, we're not changing that today. I think there's different ways the market could work it out. You know, people are saying, or the developers are telling us they wanna have a certain number on site. If that doesn't work for them or if people can't get parking, like they could choose to buy parking lots. There's different ways they could lease it. You know, interestingly, on Route 1 South, for example, we don't have these requirements. We don't have the same minimums. We say, you tell us what you need. And it's a little different there because it's not real walkable. You get a drive from one or the other, so you're not all sharing, but it's worked. I, I just want to. Other than one business. I, I just want to follow up. So uh, if we approve this, we find there is a, a, a problem with other vehicles. There's a way we can address that down, down the road. Or once we have the agreement, that, you know, because we need multiple family dwellings here, but once the agreement is, if there uh, is there a way to work with uh, the owner to say, hey, you may need more parking on that, well, I'm not sure. I think, you know, if I think one thing we need to look at as a community as we go forward is we need to look in the downtown at our on street parking. Are we maximizing that? We, you know, we don't stripe it, there's places we don't have it, that's one way we can add it, you know. We own land. If we go too far or too much happens and we have a, a crisis, then we, you know, might need to step up and contribute. A lot of municipalities own parking, own parking garages. We just don't happen to have a lot of it at this point. So, two things. One, I think if you have one parking spot on site, people yeah. will rent that and they'll they'll take that into account. Yes, we have all these other parking lots. If it becomes a problem, there'll be another solution. I mean, th yeah. we just have to come up with another solution. Yeah. It, it's not this, uh, we wanna create housing downtown and we don't want it to be expensive. And if we're making it expensive by grading yeah. more parking spot, it, it, it's a vicious circle. I do know? think it's gonna depend on types though too, it, like a condo. Right. Like if you go into a town home as a couple, you might want a garage, you might have different expectations as an owner versus a renter, like there's a proposal next door. When they originally came in, they were gonna do condos and they were gonna put parking underneath and they were gonna design it with tandem parking so they could park front Two to back. Right like now. that has since changed, but that was market driven. If you wanna buy a condo at a higher price point, people are gonna have certain expectations. So I'm gonna remind us that we've got a public hearing open, so we'll have more chance to discuss if you have more points and more things to say, but if there's anybody from the public who wants to get up and talk about parking, this is a good time to do it. So, Brett, welcome. Thank you. Can I just ask one quick question while sure. Brett's coming up? What did the planning board come at? What was the vote when they, was it, it unanimous or not? No, it wasn't unanimous. It was a 5-2 vote for the seven members and the two nays said that they thought they went a little too far when they lowered the number. They supported it but they didn't support the number they ended up at. Originally, they were talking about one and 1.25. Hey, uh, Brett Richardson, Executive Director of Freeport Economic Development Corporation. Thanks for the opportunity and really appreciate all the work that Caroline and her staff and the planning department um, and planning board has put into this. Uh, a lot of the great points um, has already been made about why this is an important move. Downtown vision, the benefits of downtown housing, uh, foot traffic, uh, uh, supporting our local businesses. We heard um, through FEDC and our board that a big concern of the, of the businesses downtown is not a concern about losing parking. It's really a concern about customers in the door and a strong desire to support uh, downtown housing to, to maintain viability and, and really build back the retail coming out of COVID. Um, we hear from employers that their workforce, they can't work nearby and workforce is a huge issue for everybody. And so if folks have to commute a half an hour to get to Freeport where they can live a little bit closer, that can make a difference. And so what we're hearing is a strong support um, for, for downtown housing, and that means lowering the parking standard. Um, and you know, one final point, we, we had unanimous support um, from our board for the recommendation from the, the planning board. We had strong turnout from our board and other constituents that we work with during that conversation at the planning board debate in support of this lower standard. And one of the things that we keep coming back to, a key point is that the town 
owns about 250 of these 3,000 spaces. Uh, and the same people who own the parking spaces to support the retail would be the people that would be making the decisions to give up that parking to support housing. And so they're not going to go so far that they're going to undercut their interests on the commercial side to support the residential. The private sector, what the town really will be doing here is creating more flexibility for developers to meet an emerging market that could be, like uh, Council Lawrence said, isn't quite as auto dependent. Um, we heard, had a great session earlier today about affordability, and parking is a substantial cost to develop in a downtown environment. And so if we want to support affordability, if we want to support density, um, there's an opportunity for the town to create more flexibility and let the private sector figure this out um, on how to use that land to the highest and best use. So FEDC is a strong proponent of this as an incremental step. You know, the, the vision said, let's go to zero. Communities all over the country are going to zero. California has got a law that they're going to pass that if you're within a half a mile of a transit station, there's no parking requirement. A developer is going to meet the market. They can, they, can, they can have parking if they need it, but they don't have to. And I think that we have to put some trust in the private sector here to, to figure this out and to work with the town to implement that vision. And that means lowering the parking as an incremental step. And it might mean going further um, and using some creating funding mechanisms to support additional strategies, whether it's striping, whether it's adding capacity. Um, but this is a good move. Freeport needs it. FEDC encourages you to support it. Thanks. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Brett. Anybody else from the public want to talk about parking? No? I can keep going. <laughs> you can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's close the public hearing and move on. So I think, Councillor Lawrence, it's up to you to close the public I hearing. I make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. All in favor? Aye. 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 Bradley, were you in on that? Yes, I'm okay, sure. thank yes, you. Hi. Six to zero, closed public hearing. And Councillor Lawrence, would you read the motion? And we can still talk about it after you read it. Yes. So. Be it ordered that amendment to the Freeport Zoning Ordinance, Section 104, Definitions, and Section 514, Off Street Parking and Loading, be approved. Second. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. Um, I'll dive in with a couple of things just because I haven't spoken yet. Firstly, thank you, Caroline, for that. 20 years in 10 slides. That was the most <laughs> concise and informative parking discussion I've ever had. Um, there was a lot to cover, and he did a great job. Um, I like our shared parking model. I think it's, uh, I don't want to say unique, but it's, it's a good thing. I've been to plenty of towns where you go and you park at some store, and then you have to move your car if you go to another store because you don't want to get towed. And we've got a lot of different stores, a lot of different property owners. That would kind of be a nightmare if we lost that. So. I like that we have it. I like that we're not getting rid of it. And I don't think this proposal aims to get rid of it. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, I think we made some changes four years ago in 2018 that, in my view, are kind of the impetus for a lot of the development proposals we're seeing now. So we changed some things then. Now we're getting some development proposed. Um, we're, we might make some more changes tonight. We might see some development proposed four years from now. So things move slowly in real estate development. This isn't something we're going to change today, and all of a sudden things are going to pop out of the ground tomorrow. Um, I do think we should be thinking about the future. What does this look like 20 years down the road? You know, things ebb and flow, and right now we're at, you know, we're coming out of a, a, a trough, right? In the, Ten years ago, maybe we were at a peak where things were full more often and, and stores were full and rents were high, and things haven't been like that in the last five years or seven years. And now we're coming out of that and growing again. So I think it would be a great problem to have if we don't have enough parking because so many people want to come to Freeport or live here or shop here. That's a good problem, right? And maybe it'll be market rate. Maybe it'll be paid. Maybe it'll be free. There are a lot of different ways we could solve it. It would be great for us to think about that and say, you know what, if we did get to the point where we needed a three-story parking structure, here's some land we might want to hang on to for a while and maybe down the road keep an eye on using it or start stashing away some capital to say, if we need a parking garage, here's one way to fund it. Um, so, you know, think about it, but I don't think that changes what we're here to do tonight. Um, so I like, I like that what we're doing is, is incremental. Um, I did have a discussion with a developer about the issue in general, and I said, how do you 
feel about this? Does this encourage you or discourage you? Not this particular proposal, but just in general, is parking that much of a barrier? And, and the response I got kind of surprised me because he said, I'm not going to build something without places for people to park. It would be nuts for me to offer that because no one would want to move there. They would want to move to another apartment where there is parking nearby. So, you know, I think what Caroline brought up is, is fairly accurate based on my, my sample size of one, uh, but it seemed like a pretty reasonable response. So, um, you know, the incremental change we're looking at is just for multifamily residential units. We're not talking about changing parking for stores. Some store owners are probably not happy about that. Um, but it, in the grand scheme of things, the change isn't all that large. Um, so I support it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, said my piece. Anybody else want to weigh in before we vote? Question. All right. All in favor of the amendments to parking zoning ordinance? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Six to zero. Thank you, Caroline, and everybody else who's been working job, on this Caroline. for a long time. Well done and well presented. Thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you gave it. <laughs> um, but don't go anywhere. She asked me if she thought if if I thought the council would want to see it. I looked at it. I'm like, are you kidding? That's the best. Yeah. Five slides on parking. Why didn't we have this presentation yeah. in 2018 mm -hmm. when we were right? People were right beating people up at the planning board, and so yeah. I've had longer good. discussions in coffee shops than here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Brett. Uh, item 178-22 has our town planner back to talk to us about non-conforming <coughs> buildings and the expansion thereof. Um, so, <coughs> Carolyn, you want to give us an introduction to this before we do the public hearing? Sure. Let me just. Get your Zoom feed. Oh, you want me on now? Back in. You don't have anything to. No PowerPoint for this? No, no, I thought one was good. Yes, sure. I'm going, I'll, I'll get there when I'm I making get there. everyone leave. I only answered oh, yeah. one PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this was something that was flagged by our code officer can, um, expansion of non conforming structures. We have people in Freeport. I just want to get this up. Oh, I didn't do it right. Okay. Give me to it. I think we um, need number one or number two. It's coming from. Do I need to, am I messing up? I stand coming, in. It's coming from a puck, Gerard. It's coming from him, right? Yeah, from the puck. Is it coming from Peter? Yeah, the puck I is red. Yeah. I thought you were doing, are you doing the wire or the puck, Peter? I'm on the puck. It's red. Oh. It says it's currently sharing. So okay. you just no, gotta. Did you do? You need to do puck two then. Try, try two or three. It needs, needs to be two. Did you turn the TV off? There yeah. we go. You're on the puck. Nice work. Yeah, yeah. This is good. Sorry, I thought you were on the new. No, HDMI. I think you got it right. Okay. The cable broke down at the first half of the meeting, so we're back to puck. Hmm. Okay. Um, so. We get requests from property owners that want to add on to their existing structures, but they don't meet setbacks. So they would be legally non-conforming structures, you know, went in before zoning. So, for example, if you live in the rural zone, you have to have a 50-foot setback. If your house is at 40 feet, you can't add on without going. adding straight back it could be adding a, a dormer and they can't do these things without going to the board and as you know because we talked about this recently and you changed the language they would now have to get a variance improve hardship from the board of appeals so back in i think 2009 when we updated our shoreland zoning ordinance our shoreland zoning regulations have a provision that allows people that have a non-conforming structure in most cases it's setbacks um, to expand as long as they Play. We did not allow that outside of the shoreland zone. Um, so we have had a few resident requests recently. We have somebody who's here tonight who wants to add up on a one story home and she can't because she's a couple feet from the property line and getting a variance would be a challenge. We've also had dormers. You can't put a dormer on if you're in a setback or we have some other people that, you know, just want to square off their structure. 
Um, so that's the proposal for you tonight. It would allow legally non-conforming structures to expand if they do not increase the non-conformity and can meet the other standards that would come into play. That was a really quick explanation. I'm happy to answer any questions. The only thing I do want to point out to you, just to be super clear, the planning board, this would apply to any non-conforming structure, so residential, regardless of the number of units, commercial, commercial in many cases has smaller setback, but just one thing to be aware of. And then, you know, I think the true intent was to help our residents stay in their homes stay in place you're always going to have some people that take advantage of whatever standard you have and so you could have people come in and just want to you know build a mcmansion because it's closer than what it would be today but just want to point those out to you Aubrey? caroline i think i just heard you say that the um the non-conformity could be any non-conformity your reference at the beginning of the presentation was for instance, the structure was built before zoning, but we're talking about a much broader set of non-conforming properties than just those that were built before there was a setback. Standard. Legally, legally non-conforming. So, for example, like your example, um, you know, like if a set, they were in one zone when they were built, and then zoning changed in 1995, they might not predate zoning, but they would be legally non-conforming. Another place we see this is subdivisions that were done in the early 90s like out on desert and Merrill, Merrill road they have acre lots there's no way they can be a 50 foot setback on either side typically setbacks lot coverage could be the other thing you know if they wanted to add on and take something else away as long as they don't increase the lot coverage that would be another example what, what's coming to mind is we've had um in the last couple of years at least a half a dozen consent agreements have to come forward to the council because of a non-conforming issue and we've tried to help the homeowner and sort of smooth things over and, and I, I voted for I think almost every one of those. Um, but I also am mindful that there are a number of violations that come forward in non-conforming issues and I just want to make sure we're not encouraging someone who's got a non-conformity that may have been a result of a clear violation and now we're just sort of smoothing it over because they didn't play by the rules three or seven or ten years ago. So we're talking about a legal non-conformity, you know, like they predate zoning or the zoning change yeah, to make okay. them. I just needed the clarity on that distinction then. So legally, other, that there's not a violation right now. Right, it's not you were legally, yes, not a, just a non-conformity because you right. did something without a permit. I do just want to clarify this is space and bulk standards, so that's setbacks, building height, lot coverage. It's not Great. cutting violations, okay, good. splitting yeah. violations, Great. all Thank those you. other things. I appreciate things. the clarity on that. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so we've got a public hearing to do on this one, uh, Councillor Bradley. Would you like to open the public hearing? Move to open the public hearing. Sec you, Second. Councilor Lawrence, all in favor? Okay. Aye. Aye. All right. Six to zero. We have public hearings. Anybody want to step to the podium and talk about uh, non-conforming buildings? Yeah, come on up. Tell us who you are. Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Siskevitz. I'm a resident and homeowner here in Freeport. And uh, this issue actually came to us um, recently because we own a piece of property. Our house is just under 1,000 square feet. And our bedroom side of our home is 30 feet from the curb, but we are just five feet from the property line. And so as we learned, our essentially our entire house is in the setback. So not only can we not add on on the street side, which we knew, but on the opposite side, we can't even put anything there because the far side of the wall, even where it's not visible from the street or for anyone else is still in that setback zone. So I'm just here in support of uh, this motion to change that. Yeah, that's so. precisely why we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to do this is to help those kinds of situations. Right. Thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. Recording in progress. Hi, my name is Louisa Picard. I live on Bow Street. And um, I'm the person that Carolyn was talking about. I am four and a half inches 
too far, too close to the property line to go up. Um, in 2002, I went in and got a variance. When Fred was here, he told me how much to get. I got that variance. And I more seriously started looking at going up last year, last October, and I ran into this situation. Um, so this would certainly help someone in my situation here. And by going up, you're still going to be four and a half inches off from where you need to be. You're not getting any closer or any further. No, I'm going straight up. At this point, I, uh, my plans had me four and a half inches on the, my second story, which I think is a little ridiculous, but oh, I see, yeah. it's what it is. Okay. <coughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming and for being patient. Uh, anything else from the public? Uh, Councilor Bradley, you want to close the public hearing? Move to close the public hearing. Second. Thank you, Councilor Lawrence. All in favor? Aye. All right. All right. Public hearing is closed. Councilor Bradley, do you want to read the order? Be it ordered that amendments to the Freeport Zoning Ordinance, Section 202 excuse me, dot C.1, dot non conforming buildings, and Sections 104 definitions pertaining to the expansion of non conforming buildings slash structures be approved. Second. Councilor Lawrence. Anybody else have any thoughts, questions, opinions, comments? All right. All in favor of the amendments for the zoning ordinance? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's six to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for all that. And uh, it looks like you're still up, I think. Or at least hopefully this fixes the issues for our residents. Yeah. Thank you for, for your patience tonight and also over this last several months as you waited for us to get months to it. And months to get to it so yeah. Thank you for your patience. All right. Uh, so now we are on to another thing that we've been looking at for several months. This is our incidental <laughs> processing of on site earth materials ordinance, uh, basically, sort of our rock crushing ordinance. Um, are you introducing this or is Caroline introducing this? I can introduce it. I don't think there's a ton of discussion on it, but um, I could be surprised. I'm not sure if anyone in the public is here to speak about it, but um, Caroline might want to chime in on the, the review and permitting and review process um, that's contained in the ordinance because that is new. The spirit of this was reviewed and written by the ordinance committee. There were some additions that happened after Caroline and I consulted with the town attorney about um, a process to review applications um, that are made. Basically, our ordinances prohibit, unless you're a quarry or a rock crushing uh, operation that's approved under uh, processing section of the zoning ordinance, you can't uh, process materials from offsite. Think of it like a quarry. You can't haul in 100,000 yards of gravel and crush it or screen it and then resell it on site. That's what a that's what a quarry or a uh, gravel pit is for. So there's a separate review and approval process for that if you're bringing things on or if you're extracting them and selling them off site. Those are two kind of different uses in the zoning ordinance. This, those remain as is. Um, this pertains solely to material that's processed on site, which was never really a thing up until, I don't know, five years, 10 years ago when mobile rock crushers and mobile gravel screening mills became prevalent, they became more affordable. Uh, people were able to rent them or to buy them and use them in smaller operations. It used to be a very costly thing. You'd used to have to truck all of your gravel off to get it screened off site or uh, all of your stone off to get it crushed at a quarry and then bring either buy their material and they'd add that to their material stock or bring back whatever got crushed, have it processed for you. Now mobile, uh, Portable operating mills, either screeners or crushing operations, are they're like tractor trailer size, and they can just back them up on site, and you can use an excavator to shovel dirt into it or gravel into it, crush it or screen it, and have a product that you can use. So this is becoming something that's seen in more, uh, you know, construction projects around town. So it's something that was raised as a concern to the council and then to the ordinance committee um, by residents. This basically allows 100 cubic yards to be processed on site. Uh, nothing needed, you know, no questions asked, you're in compliance. Um, if you process more than 100 cubic yards of material from on site and it stays on site, you need to go to the project review board. There's a permit and application process in here for them to review and approve it. Uh, the original version we talked about at the ordinance committee had it coming to the town council. 
And the town attorney said, you don't want that. That becomes political. You want a set of objective standards, and you want the project review board to be reviewing that. So it's not, well, we like this person, or we don't like that person. So we're going to approve um, the application. Other than that, the spirit of the ordinance stays the same as what we discussed with the ordinance committee. Councilor Bradley. Yeah, I guess <clears throat> in the spirit of uh, it shouldn't be a council issue, why should it be a project review board issue? Why shouldn't it be a staff issue? I mean, it's such a, it seems so administrative to me. It involves counting the cubic yards, which having a hearing on doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's my question. It's a good question. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't understand why it would change that at all. I mean, you you could make a, a requirement that there be a, a notification to the still delegate the responsibility to the staff. Um, I think if we wanted to do it, if you wanted to do it that way, one of the compromise could be having it go to staff review board, which meets on an as needed basis, daytime meeting. They can schedule, you know, turn around in about a week. It's for smaller projects, but it would give that public input process. Yeah, it just, or you could do nothing. As, we, as we're going through the revision thing, we hear a lot about how much the project review board has got to do and how much it has on its plate and how long it takes to get through them. And adding this to that doesn't... Anyway, that's my thought. Councilor Fournier. Staff review is... Staff review is fire... Who's on the board, yep. Yep, fire chief, public works director, code enforcement officer, planner, engineer... The proposal that we're going to bring you with the site plan amendments is going to also suggest that we add the police chief to that. Okay. I think that makes sense. I think a little bit of the concern was that also that um, having one person do it, regardless of who or which person's making that decision, whether it's me, whether it's Caroline, whether it's the engineer, whether it's the code enforcement officer. Um, I think part of the concern that brought this forward was that decisions were made um, not by a group, but rather by one person. Yeah, one person. And if if it's somebody who is really like, yeah, this is no big deal. Um, there's not a there's not a, a multitude of voices from different directions that were concerned. So that was part of what was brought forward. That was the, why the original intent was to have it be a council process. Um, I think the council would have been much quicker. And to answer the question of the project review board, I, I, I agree with you. I think that process was a lot quicker. Town attorney and I had some philosophical debates for, you know, five or ten minutes um, over whether speed and, you know, uh, customer friendliness was the right way to do it or whether, you know, taking the politics out of it. I think she's right. It really shouldn't be political. Um, so it does need to go somewhere else, but it was a good debate. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're mutually, excuse, mutually yeah. exclusive, I think. So. I think I just want to clarify. So staff review board, they review gravel pit renewals, which is similar to this on a much bigger scale. We have one gravel pit. They come in every three years, but um, they do this type of thing. The other thing is the way the ordinance is written. If something comes to staff review and it's super controversial or really problematic, they can, they can vote mm -hmm. to send it to project review. Yeah, Councilor Egan. Would, if, if we uh, amend this and have it go to a staff review board with the public notice, is that only if there's more than 100 cubic yards? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm concerned about, mm -hmm. I guess, is that um, 100 cubic yards, you know, in a gravel pit operation is very small. But 100 cubic yards, if you're putting in a six-lot subdivision, is... Um, you know, that's a significant amount of the site work that might be done, which could cause significant disruption. So I'm, I'm mostly particularly focused on the surrounding neighbors knowing that something like this is going to happen. I think I agree that it's perfectly suitable for a staff review board, but I'm, 
I'm concerned that the 100 cubic yards number is too high for that. If somebody processed 90 cubic yards and didn't have to do anything, that could still be quite disruptive if there were neighbors nearby, even if they're out there measuring and they're exactly 301 feet away from the nearest house. Well, it's I mean, I will say that most, this actually has a more ample notification process than a standard site plan, like a commercial project. I mean, you could see this for one person building a house, but I think we're mostly going <coughs> to see it in association with a commercial project that's already been through some level of public process with so it's, that's eight, like eight 15 yard dump bodies, like large dump trucks. Eight dump trucks worth of stuff. Yeah, 100 cubic yards. Yeah. Like uh, 15 cubic would be a large, they might not even be that size, but I think 13 yeah, is a common. The bigger trucks are. Yeah. And that was, the 100 was, remember a while back it was, that, it started 200, at 200 because yeah. yeah. that's what we do when you haul in other types of yeah, fill yeah. material. So that was the first reduction. Councilor Fournier. I, I think to be, if the no neighbors are notified, I'm comfortable with 100 cubic yards. I think if there's a noise issue, we have a noise ordinance that can be applied. We have an ordinance that tells them you can't start early in the morning. I think we have ample protection to protect that. I'm comfortable with this going to the staff review with the public notification of all the people in there to make it a smoother, easier process. Yeah, I'll, my opinion on it is that um, it was brought up by neighbors who had issues with the potential for this disruptive uh, activity going on. There are a lot of things that we're looking to optimize and streamline in town. I don't think this is one of them. I think this is one we're almost trying to do the opposite. We, we want to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't, I'll say, sneak in and suddenly appear. Like, I didn't know that all of a sudden they're doing rock crushing next to my house uh, for the next well, three months. But so there's a public notice period that, that we're keeping in, but also in here is a public hearing that they're suggesting would happen before project review. So you get your public notice, you get your postcard in the mail, and there's a meeting, and it might take three, four weeks before you get on the agenda for the meeting, but you have some notice and the ability to show up at the meeting and say, here's why I don't think this is such a great idea, and there can be some discussion, and that can be a public meeting. So I, I don't think this is the kind of thing we want to encourage all the time. We don't want a lot of 100 cubic yard plus rock crushing operations going on in town. We probably want very, very, very few of them. So I don't expect this to even show up a lot. And when it does show up, I, I'd be okay with it going to, to project review. But, but, but let me yeah. give you a yeah. different angle. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, we live down on, well, we got 60 acres on Old Flying Point Road. If I was to put another house in there, I got a ton of ledge. And it's going to be more than 100 cubic feet of ledge. I don't want to go through extra loops. I own the property. It's been our family for five generations. I'm thinking we have enough in place. I notify the neighbors. I come up. I come before a staff review. I think that will be adequate um, because I, I, I think we have enough protections in place. I, wasn't the problem that they weren't even notified and it just started happening? Yeah, there's no. There was no. So yeah. this, this yeah, there's no ordinance people. at all right now. How long does it take to crush a hundred yards of stone? I think we had heard they were there for like a. Well, no, they, they, that no, was no, no, that was that oh, was, hundred yards. Yeah, yeah hundred yards is not yeah. a lot. Yeah, hundred yards. A day, yeah. a day. Yeah. So a couple out, days. Do we remember so how? The time they, hey, they're crushing. It's already done. You I don't remember, but part of this was you guys already amending the loitering curfew and noise ordinance, so you already put a timing limitation on the hours. Yeah. There, but there was uh, there were numbers that were thrown around. I'm, don't don't quote me on them, and I'm not trying to give false well, hope. But it, I think it was thousands of cubic yards would have taken week or weeks, kind of a thing. So right. so 100 yards in a day or two, I don't think it's a huge inconvenience. People I, live it. And when I talked to those people, they they were like, we're okay with the subdivision, we're okay, but it's mm -hmm. all the time, and that's right, right. that's Part, yeah, 100 yards is fine. Part of my concern so, with I think with the with my only concern with this process was exactly what Councillor Fournier just mentioned, which is somebody who's in the middle of the woods who owns, well, I forget, 60 acres. What if you own 100 acres and you're doing an operation in the middle that's never going to hear or be seen, but yet uh, I, where it's right next to somebody's house? Absolutely. Have at it. We should, we should make that difficult yeah. or subject to a very strict review that is going to take into account all those things. But... I mean, even on 10 acres, if you were in the middle of it, you're not going to get dust. You're not going to get a ton of vibration. Um, you might get a little bit of noise at your property lines. But I think finding that balance is tough. There is a notification 
window of 500 feet um, from the property lines, which would, in the case you described, loop in a lot of people, everybody that's 500 yards from that 60 acres would be notified. Um, but if it's really in the middle of that, all your neighbors are gonna go, oh, it's, that's 800 feet from my property line, who cares? Right. It should be fast so, either way. Yeah. I, I think the notifi- You're also going to pay fees when you come in, just saying. Yeah. Right. We're, we're going to pay fees, and I think the staff review is, is, is a place to go. I, I, I think it's less intimidated. And, and I just think we have enough protection and everything with, with this ordinance here to, to leave it as it going to the staff review. That's, that's what we. Do we are we able to amend this on the fly? That's what I, was just I, I don't I think just read it through it and substantially. I, um, would change the intent of the ordinance. I think if someone made a motion, they could probably just say replace project any, review yeah, with because uh, I just read through it. and I didn't see anywhere where it would be procedurally funky if it went from project review to staff review. I just did a quick read of it. There were like 12 different references. No, the only thing from a practice that's different is right now we notify within 200 feet. This would be notifying within 500 yes. feet of all the parcel boundaries. You'd pay your fee. This also has a formal public hearing process. The do you, do you conduct those though, right? The staff review board does not put it conduct a formal public hearing. So a formal public hearing is putting the legal ad in the newspaper of general circulation, paying the money. Um, staff review does not do that. They do the typical posting, just like council does, hallway, library, et cetera. Um, and then they do the note. They would do direct mail to the. Could, this would just be different than the current practice, though, correct? You could. They've Is never had a formal open and closed public hearing just like you guys right and we always take public comments so do people tend to show up at staff review um very we? rarely we had like one or two people show up for a gravel pit usually they'll want to know or like they've heard a blast but um, well, so the marching the marching orders for staff review board generally from myself and from the council in the past has been, hey, when something gets controversial and 20 people show up to staff review board, that's when it goes to project review because yeah. they're the ones who were, who were really able to take the controversial mm-hmm. hearing. They do it regularly. It's pretty limited. Most of what they've been reviewing is like fill permits and unless neighbors don't like each other, people haven't really been coming. I don't see most of these being controversial unless, some, unless it's like, hey, I'm going to do it right in the VC1 zone, you know, up on Maple Ave, I'm going to be running a rock crusher to turn the, you know, I mean, who knows? We just have a lot of rural area in town that, that this is not, you know, and, and I just think we I have, do we think have that's a, where we get a lot of the complaints, like with traditional subdivisions, it's in rural areas, and so they, they notice and feel the impact more than, you know, someone that's in the commercial district like I think they blasted a couple years ago down at DeMillo's and we really never knew we like we never got calls but probably any most people didn't know well you well you have a blasting ordinance now too and you can always change it too if we start seeing a lot of these with staff review where they're controversial we will bring it back so the proposal is to just change project review board to staff review that's it seems like the consensus is when when we read the motion we can just say you know with the, the okay. change that um well and any reference to project review board would be replaced by staff review board and maybe maybe offer that as an amendment that we strike PRB and replaced with staff review board wherever it occurs. Well, we haven't even read it in yet, so right, we can right, just read right, it right. in with that change. Okay. Yeah, um, we haven't done a public hearing on it yet. So, um, Mr. Vice Chair, would you open the public hearing and we can check for Zoom comments too? There's none. There's none. Okay. Uh, make a motion to open the public hearing on item number one seven nine dash two two. Thank you, Councillor Bradley. Um, anybody from the public? Jim, want to be a resident for today? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and nobody on Zoom, you said? We've got zero on Zoom. Correct. Okay. Councilor Egan, would you like to close the public hearing? Uh, i make a motion to close the public hearing on item number 179-22. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Councilor Lawrence. All in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, and do you want to take a stab at reading the order with the change? Uh, yeah. Uh, be it ordered that the proposed new ordinance chapter 64 incidental processing of on-site earth materials with the amendment to strike 
project review board and replace with staff review board be approved? Second. Second. Uh, thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor of the new ordinance has changed. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Six. We have to vote on it as amended. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it was read as um, with the changes incorporated in it, so there wasn't an amendment. It was just the order itself was with the new language because <coughs> uh, it hadn't been on the floor yet. Uh, there is one thing on here: the public. A public hearing. What do we say about that? Are they going to go to a public hearing? Yep. I think yeah, it still would be a public hearing. It would just be before the staff review board. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think is your work done for, with us tonight? Um, yeah, I'm going to go to my next job. Put people to bed. <laughs> <laughs> her, her work is done, but her workload just got yeah. staff review board just gets more uh, mm. kind of spicy. Yep. I don't want to be bored. <laughs> you, you will never be bored. That's I can good. guarantee you that. As Thank long you, as Caroline. I'm sitting here, you'll never be bored. Thank you, Caroline, for great, great uh, presentations this evening. Yeah, your your presentation on parking was spectacular. Thank you. It's the first time I even got close to understanding what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we are into general assistance, item 180. Dash 22, uh, which I think is about just updating some dollars, some dollars to match the new year. But do you want to give us a five minute it. or less summary? I'll, I'll do it in a sentence. We're we're required to, um, if we're going to get state reimbursement for general everything. assistance dollars spent, we're required to use the state required <coughs> uh, levels, which is so we have to change this whenever those change, and they're done by geographic region. I think where Cumberland County outside of Portland is one region and could be wrong they could have changed it but that's making it's just making that change yearly on the new levels that are adopted and because we're changing an ordinance we have to do a public hearing that's correct because it's in our the um, levels are contained in our ordinance we have to do it through amending an ordinance and we're required to have in an ordinance we can't take it out of the ordinance and say just use the state levels whatever they are in the ordinance? Uh, whenever I try that, I'm always told by people that that is bad legal precedent, that we shouldn't have a variable thing in there because and multiple attorneys have told us this, that okay. if the council is responsible for setting the amounts, that you should vote on them every time they change. Okay. I personally would like to do it your way, but <laughs> I've gotten consistent advice that they should be changed when... Yep. It tends to be a pretty short discussion in my few years up here, so... Yeah, it's no... It's not. It's. I mean, we have the ability not to follow these rules, but yeah. we would lose the state reimbursement, and I, I we could set lower amounts. But if we didn't comply with state standards, they wouldn't pay us anything. So I'd rather play it safe. Yep. Uh, Councillor Pillsbury, do you want to read all the language to set the public hearing? We'll keep the language in here for now. We might talk about reducing the language next time, but for now, let's keep it. Yep. Uh, be it ordered that a public hearing be set for October 4, 2022, at the town council meeting. It starts at 6 p.m. to discuss amendments to Chapter 46, General Assistance Ordinance and Appendices A to H for the period October 1, 2022 to September 30th, 2023. Be it further ordered, the copies be distributed equally between the Town Clerk's Office, Town Manager's Office, and the Freeport Community Library for inspection by citizens during normal business hours, and the notice be placed on Freeport's local cable channel 3 and the Town's website. Second. Second. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. Um, any other questions, discussion on setting the public hearing? All in favor of setting the public hearing? Aye. Aye. Everybody, uh, thank you for that. Uh, next up is item 181-22 regarding awarding a bid for some digital public radios and accessory equipment, which I gather is why Chief Conley is here with us tonight. <laughs> um, do you want to tell us what we're about to approve? So this is the uh, the other part of the uh, radio communications in the portable radios uh, that uh, we brought up a while ago. It's, this is what we're talking about. Uh, so I went out and got three bids for uh, 30 of these radios and uh, they come back. So there's three companies in the state of Maine that I sent bids to. I received one from RCM uh, for that. RCM, as a footnote, RCM was the uh, vendor that put in the whole system. Um, that we've got and the manufacturer of it is so we stayed Ken, Kenwood product 
and those products are consistent throughout the PD, fire rescue and stuff. So we're trying to keep in the same product line uh, with that. Bid come back uh, from RCM for uh, 28,991 dollars. So I'm seeking approval of that process. So. Chief, can you remind us what the estimate was in the capital budget when we approved this? Because I remember looking at this, it seems like we were estimating higher than the 28,991, weren't we? Um, I think we were, yeah, I think the total amount was like 40,000. Yeah. So. so roughly a little under $1,000 per unit? Yes. For buying 30 of those radios? And that's a consistent unit um, model and compatibility between fire PD and rescue. yeah this these radios allow us to have that digital uh, communications with the PD monitoring them and so forth uh, with that uh, and work with the uh, mobile radios that we've got in the apparatus so we're pretty much consistent Great. Council Bradley chief <clears throat> I, I'm sort of seeping back into a couple of these things and my impression is that you go out looking for bids from a number of people and you get one back. Is that your impression that you're, you're only getting one bid back from the group that you send them out to? Well, it's, it's, we're finding is a lot of places are not putting in bids because, uh, you know, one, their availability of the product, uh, supply chain issues. The second thing is, um, you know, that aspect of it is are they you know they recognize who who's done the work and so forth and sometimes they recognize the fact that you know that vendor is probably more suited than than they are um, but all three dealers in this case were Kenwood dealers here in Maine um, so I'm comfortable with with that and when I talked to one of the vendors they said they're not surprised that you know some of them are not bidding on some of these jobs any sense that uh, these vendors are uh, agreeing who should get the bid and submitting it to you? I I'm sorry, Council, I didn't. And three guys, all vendors from Kenwood, right? And they sit down at a meeting for coffee and they say, we got these three bids. Why don't you take this one? I, I have no idea if they have any back channel, you know. I'm just, that my, that's my concern is that we're, we're not getting competitive bids. What we're getting is single responses and I'm just wondering whether that's typical um, it seems to be happening you know uh, on a number of fronts yeah. these days and granted I, I understand your concern uh, on the fairness of that and get the actual bid um, what I can tell you is that uh, with this bid was also too is that the vendor up fronted the uh, rebates on the front end of that so we've gotten you know a good deal yeah do you do you have any communication with other towns about whether they're having the same experience that you are of getting only single bids back I can't say that I've actually had a physical conversation but I mean the general chatter is is that you know um, places are only coming back with one we've seen that in in uh, fire apparatus yeah. you know. so the concern would be that there was some sort of agreement about pricing which would not be not only I, I'm not going to go so far as to say that I know you're not but yeah. that that's my that's the concern I'm trying to express and I I you know if you would keep your eye out on that and in sort of alert the council to when you're not getting competitive bids back yeah it was also posted so people far and wide that had no connection to any of those companies could have submitted a bid. It didn't Any one of them could have. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they didn't. Council Fournier? I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief. Some of the companies are, are not in the immediate area. This particular company has done work for us in the past. They know what we have for system. Uh, and I know when I used to bid stuff out, uh, one of the companies was up in rural Maine, and the guy said, hey, I'm not driving from rural Maine to Freeport, Maine, to work on your system when you got a guy next door that's going to sell you the same thing. So I'm sure that's probably st some of the, the issues that have gone on with uh, the type of supply chain issues we have everything. So I, I'm just curious, and you may not know this off the top of your head, but what would the retail price be? It would be probably far more than what we're paying on this bid, because if I remember right, portable radios are what, 1700 bucks a pop now, digital? These digital radios, it's, the accessories right around $1,000 a piece. 
on this bid. But what is it, the what? normal retail oh, price? I mean, when I took and started out with it, oh, it was about twelve hundred. Okay. Yeah. All know. right. Yep. Thank so. you. And the three and Chief, who also mentioned as far as the uh, one, that's one of the ones that you know I sent to, and the other one was um, you know, up in Mid Maine too. So. Councillor Fournier, would you like to do oh, the honor on reading this? Thank you. Uh, be it ordered that uh, Radio Communication Management, RCM, be awarded a bid for digital portable radios and accessory equipment in the amount of $28,991. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Any other questions for the Chief or otherwise? All right. All in favor of awarding the bid? Aye. 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 Thank opposed? you very much. Everybody. Thank you, Chief, for doing the work on this. Okay. It looks like we're up to library time, finally. Um, thank you for being patient. <laughs> We've got a couple of, of library items with, with something else thrown in the middle there to throw you off. Um, but first up is uh, library late fees. Yes, yeah, so I uh, don't have thereof. a PowerPoint presentation. You did send a letter. To oh. take a deep dive into the history of library right. fines. But you get credit for, for the letter. Time. Remember okay. I told you it wasn't going to be late when you, oh, yeah, you'll be up there at 8. This yeah. is all no If I recall here. correctly, I think you've already lost that bet. Yeah, I think I yeah. did. So, uh, historically, libraries charge late fees. Uh, this is nothing new. Um, Freeport has been charging um, 10 cents a day for most materials um, with a cap of $1.50 per item. Um, that was actually changed when I came on board a few years ago. It used to be higher. Pandemic hit. And I don't know of any library that continued to charge late fees for a variety of reasons. And we don't need to get into the weeds, but you can certainly ask questions if you'd like to know those details. But we've all suspended um, late fees. Um, and in that time, we really didn't see a drastic change in behavior. If nothing else, people were happy about that. Life is complicated. Um, but this has also been a national trend um, for quite a while. So I could certainly give you uh, case studies and statistics, but needless to say, um, I just read that between 2017 and 2022, um, the percentage of public libraries charging late fees dropped from 92% to 36%. Okay, So our neighbors are doing the same thing. You have larger library systems in Maine that have been dropping them, but very recently, um, the Merrill Memorial Library in Yarmouth has done that, Curtis has done that in Brunswick. So this is something that most people are embracing. So why did we have late fees? Why did we have late fees? Uh, contrary to popular opinion, libraries do not want to just make rules for the fun of it, um, thought, or, or charge or punish you for not returning something on time. But there has been, you know, a feeling that okay, so fines are a source of revenue, right? You pay a little late fee, it goes into the coffers. In our case, it's going to go into the general fund. Um, fines act as an incentive to return materials on time for the next user. It's the carrot at the end of the stick. And fines teach people, particularly children, how to be responsible for their materials. So I, I'm going to dispute all of those things. The re so fines are not a reliable source of revenue. And that's because you know we have relationships with people, and life is complicated. And you come in, and you're sick. Your car, your car was in an accident. Um, life just happened, and you didn't get it on time. The material was returned. It's not damaged. We're happy. We're going to waive it. So staff have a lot of discretion. Um, and on average, less than 1% of FCL items are overdue or billed at any given time. So that's statistically irrelevant. So we do not depend on this revenue. The town does not depend on this revenue. Um, and contrary to uh, providing an incentive, we really feel that it prese um, presents a, a barrier to service. So you've got families. You've got older folks. You've got anybody in any variety of uh, walks of life that a fine could actually prevent them from using the library. And to date, you know, the, the cards have, are frozen at $10. You owe $10 or more, you can't use your card. And that could just be late fees. So if we, we allow users to take out 30 items at a time per card, you get a family, life gets messy, now you've got a pile of cash that you owe us. And that does not broker goodwill. So that sets up not a great um, interaction um, um, relationship. So they're not incentivizing people. So it causes hardship, stress, embarrassment, 
Um, and we really do feel these days that fines are inconsistent with our mission, which is to remove barriers and provide people access to information. So if it's not achieving the goals that it set out to achieve, why are we doing this? Um, and we are not tasked with helping people learn how to be responsible with their items. We are happy to refer you to a book so you can learn how to do that. But we would really like those conversations to happen at home, particularly if you're talking about children. So what we're asking for tonight is that the town council permanently adopt fine-free services at the library. And before you discuss or ask me a question, I want to be clear that we are not doing away with replacement fines. So you damage something when you have it out, you lose it, that's a replacement cost. We have to do that um, for a variety of reasons. So this is not a free-for-all. This is just the late fees. So provided something comes back and we're happy with it, we're good to go. Any questions? Councilor Bradley. I, I love the idea. <clears throat> there's got There's one thing that you didn't address, though, and that's the abuser, the guy, the guy who sits on a book. It's a bestseller. He hands it out to his family for two months, and everybody in town wants the book. Yep. Do you have a, a, an ability to get that book back in some other way? Sure. So 20 days past that due date, the, re the fine stops accruing, and it just turns over to a replacement charge. So bottom line, now that card is, is completely frozen. And you, people certainly will elect to then pass it along. You know, it is what it is. So you, that, we're not doing away with that tool. Nope. How much do you typically collect in fines in a year? Six thousand dollars. Six thousand dollars. There you go. Okay. Yep. So when I do have a question from a budgetary perspective, I've got that up here mm -hmm. you budget we budgeted have budgeted traditionally six thousand dollars a year for fines yes in fy 21 fy 22 so the fiscal year that currently ended you collected six thousand one hundred eleven dollars yeah. were those all replacement fines no so what's hard about i actually i wanted to be prepared to give you an exact number of i don't need exact i, I know yeah I know. yeah um, because what goes in, in for the on the accounting side, that, that could be replacement charges, that could certainly be late fees, that could be um, somebody needed to print and they didn't bring cash, so we added it to their account. That's also going to be non-resident fees. Okay. So everything kind of goes into the till. Yeah. So okay. Less, so, less but, than 6, but we're consistent. We're hitting our budget levels. We're still you were. Correct. So we're not collecting them. We're still hitting that budget. Now we charge sixty dollars a year, so that extra five dollars is definitely well, making up that difference. <laughs> but yeah, and also, you know, so if um, a, an item is yeah, lost or damaged cool. or an interlibrary loan, other libraries are reimbursing us for that. And we didn't set that up, Councillor Egan. I, I was just <laughs> literally wondering if we haven't been charging late fees, yeah. why we're still making our budget right. numbers, which is great. All oh, right, I'm very happy with that. It. That was it. That late fees. Yeah. Thank you for the pretty clear, concise Welcome. presentation, even without PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Lawrence, would you like to read that this order? Yes. Be it ordered that the town fee schedule be amended to eliminate library late fees. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Councillor Bradley. Any discussion, questions for our library director? All in favor of eliminating the library fee, late fees? Aye. 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 That's everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go too far. Uh, item 183-22 uh, is one that I'm happy to introduce, uh, which is that on Tuesday, October 11th, which is a, an in-between week for us, it's a, meet, a, a week we wouldn't ordinarily have a council meeting, um, I would ask that we have a, a workshop with the Downtown Vision Implementation Task Force and the public. Um, We've done a lot of work on the downtown vision since it came out in May. Um, we haven't really had an opportunity to engage with the public. So think of this as like a little mini open house where we get to say, here's what the task force is recommending based on the plan. Um, and then hear from the public as to what they like and don't like about it. And also for us to start having the discussion about what do we do with this plan? How do we think about moving it forward and actually getting some of this stuff done as opposed to just having this nice vision that's on our shelf? Um, so that gives us a chance to talk about it, um, not in the confines of a meeting, because I don't expect we'll take action on it, but more just a discussion. So that's what, what I'm proposing. Uh, I 
think we sort of discussed it informally the date um, to uh, I asked everybody to kind of save the date um, so are there any questions about that before we add it to the calendar Councillor Bradley yeah I, I'm I have no problem with this at all but I, I guess my question is is there a time that you sense or see where the council will sit down together and have this discussion you know on its own to sort of get a sense of where we where we are yeah I'll give you my opinion on it and of course we can decide as a group what, how we want to handle it but um, at the workshop we'll be talking in theory about a lot of stuff do we like this do we not like this if there's general consensus what I would suggest is that if we're still you know the same group of us in November December how I'd suggest we handle it is in December when we start kind of resuming our, our meeting schedule um, I would incorporate this into the goal setting process for the next year so as a council we've often adopted goals for the year to say these are things that we want to use as guidelines uh, so I would suggest taking some of the things that we take out of the downtown vision and say these are also some of our goals for the year um, and then that in turn is sometimes what we refer to when we start doing the budget process or when others are doing the budget on our behalf they say well the council said they want to keep taxes down so let's incorporate that into the budget the council said they want to do this downtown project let's think about putting that in the budget so my question is <coughs> you know goal setting is usually pretty general um, big big ideas um, and it seems to me that we're starting to narrow down into particulars for prioritization of the revisioning process and is that consistent well, we've done both so with the task force we've we've split the big list into exactly. goals and also projects in my, <coughs> my manners um, what I what I'm sensing is that through the process that you've instituted and through the FEDC and through this process what we're doing is we're getting closer and closer to um, picking things that we will fund yes and um, if we the council the first time the council sits down to talk about prioritization is in the context of goal setting my question is have we focused clearly enough um, the things that we will want to prioritize? In other words, when are we going to have a discussion about what we think is important as opposed to just generally speaking we support it? A number of ways I could answer that. So I know you and some of the other counselors have been at some of the task force meetings when yeah. we've been discussing what things we want to move forward. Um, the workshop I'm hoping will be a good discussion for us to say it's great that these 10 projects are being proposed but I really like project number 11 and I want to see that one added to the list so I'm hoping that it's a vibrant discussion that that we're able to have um, but when it's actually like when do we actually put funds towards it no, 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 that's no. just the budget yeah yeah but it, the, the thing that's causing me to question is it's one thing for us to sit down and have yeah. that and yep. I think that discussion is needed at this yep. level I have no problem with having one of the public discussion putting them together to me seems I'm sitting here listening to the public and I, you, you don't want to jump in on somebody from the public who's coming at something for the first time and you tell them what you think the six priorities are it just it sort of it doesn't mesh so <coughs> you know if you think you're just going to get all of the people who are expert at this in at this public hearing but you could get a whole range of people coming in at various levels of information and what we really need is my view is to hear from each of us where, what we've taken from all of this process that's gone on that some of us have been close to some of us haven't but as a council we're going to have to make some pretty fine decisions about prioritization and budgeting and we need to start that and I don't see doing that with the public in the middle of a public process that's my that's my question yeah no, I understand I, I'll say that I wasn't comfortable with the opposite I wasn't comfortable with saying the public had their input through May and then we gave it to a task force and then we gave it to the council and we never went back to the public to, to ground truth the, the priorities if you will um, so I thought in sort of a public hearing style we'd, we'd hear from the public but then we would have an opportunity to say well here's here's where we are with priorities uh, and if the public hates that I'd like to hear that um, so um, you know we're not asking the public to, to vote on it on the 11th we're not asking the council to vote on it on the 11th 
Um, but I, I imagine that by the end of the night, we're probably going to start to have some consensus, maybe with a few items that are tabled for further discussion. Um, and all these discussions, I think, are fair game on the for the workshop as well. The, the process itself is something we can chat about. Um, but I'll also open the offer that like I, I did to you earlier, Ed, if anybody wants to chat one-on-one -on -one before the workshop just to kind of nail down the process or get a preview of stuff, I'm, I'm happy to do that anytime. Um, or, or send an email to, to where what we have so far. Uh, but if we do this, I, I would hope that we um, would encourage folks to come and, and contribute. So, is it okay with that? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to vote yes for this, but I'm not okay with the idea that the council is not going to get a chance to sit by itself and have this kind of conversation in prioritization process before going into the budget. No, that, that we will in December. If, you know, if it's up to me, then that, that's what I intend. Yeah, we're not, we're not voting on that, that right. Thursday. We're just getting all the input no, and talking I'm and then. The okay. All right. Um, so I'll grab this one. Uh, be it ordered that the council set a workshop on Tuesday, October 11th, 2022 at 6 p.m. to review the work of the Downtown Vision Implementation Task Force with the council and the public. Second. Thank you, Councilor Egan. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's everybody. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, that's the end of our action items. We are now into other business, and we have Ms. Sparks again to talk about our long-term library building planning. <laughs> okay. So, the conversations have been had about a library expansion since before I arrived in 2017. If I remember correctly, there was a, a sizable amount of money set aside to look into that possibility. It became clear, so the, the building's 25 years old. So it's not old, it's not new, um, it's lived in. And I know for, I, I'm gonna guess, about a decade, possibly more, um, the consensus has been that the youth services department needs more space for the kids, for the middle schoolers that come over. Um, so, in 2019, we took the $10,000 that the council appropriated, um, talked to three architects, hired a firm, worked with them, and they came up with a conceptual design. So we actually, I just like noted, we spent $7,500 after $10,000. Um, so those plans were finalized in June 2021. We were given a project budget and that came in, if we're looking at today's dollars, of about $1.5 million. That would have added 1,800 square feet, um, ex pretty much exclusively for teens, and renovated 3,000 square feet, again, entirely in, use, in the youth services department. So in, that, in the interim, <laughs> Arlene decided to retire, <laughs> and then we needed a director. Um, and leading up into my hiring, I started really thinking about, uh, well, A, that's a lot of money. Um, I always think things cost more than they should, but that is a lot of money. Um, then we went through a lot of economic uncertainty, which we're certainly not out of. I had a lot of questions about how will the pandemic change library usage? Will it change library usage? Will people come back? So immediately, I decided not to come to you for the budget workshop shortly after I was hired with these plans because I started to get a little uncomfortable about that much money being allocated to less than half of the building. Um, and what I've observed since is, luckily, people are coming back. Actually, the statistics, I, don't, I should have brought them for tonight, but circulation and bodies in the building and program attendance is rebounding really nicely. We're, our numbers, especially the, the door count that we do, so people coming in and out, and the circulation stats are getting close to what they were right before shutdown in March of 2020. So that's great. We'd had a record year the year before, which almost skews our statistics. But if we were to average them out, we're really in strong shape. But interestingly, the usage of the building has really changed. So now I'm seeing um, more areas that could use tweaking than just use services. Um, and initially, when I started these conversations with Peter about what to do with the building, I wasn't seeing as many kids coming into the library. That's changing, which is, uh, again, uh, somebody said this at the beginning of the meeting, it is a good problem to have, 
but we are filling up again. Um, a good chunk of them are outside where they're unsupervised, which is another um, issue, but a number of them are inside. So now we have sort of competing interests and it's a good opportunity to pause, to circle back what I'm asked, well, I'm, I'm really updating you, is what I'd like to do is re-engage the architectural firm that we used. Um, I have unrestricted donation money that I'd like to pay for, for a, a whole building conceptual design. This architectural firm, I would like you to know, has worked with a number of libraries. They do great work. You're gonna see their names everywhere at Simon Architects. They did the Falmouth Library. They just did the Rice Library, so they do really great work. They're easy to work with, too, and they, and they know libraries. So I think it would make sense to have a holistic um, study of the library. And in order to do that, I'd really like to form either a working group, as Peter calls it, or a building committee. Um, comprise of library staff and council, members of the public, the board, you know, our stakeholders, RSU, um, so that this is truly a community project. If I'm, I and other stakeholders are gonna come to you asking for a pile of money, whether it's $1.5 million or more, I wanna feel really strong about this, that this, the, the building needs it. So without getting into details of all the needs that we're seeing right now, um, you know, my goals right now are, uh, a, to form that committee, but B, you know, what does the, what does the building need for this interim phase of its life? Um, we don't need a new library. We don't need a giant expansion. Can we expand the footprint a little bit in new services to give those kids some space? Can we rearrange existing space on the adult end to meet the needs of, say, the remote workers that are coming? And I have, today, I had half a dozen people who were remote working at the library. Sometimes they need quiet space. Sometimes they need space where they can teleconference, and I have one room for that. I have one room to, for tutors, for conferencing, for small library programs, one room to rule them all, and it does not rule them all. <laughs> so I need, I need spaces. Can we throw up walls to make that happen as opposed to more expensive construction work? Um, so I would like to do that with the help of the community, because this is the community library. I don't want this to be you know, the library staff show and come to you with either one proposal or several that we can, we can really discuss as a community. So that's where we're at. Questions? Do you have an idea of what, how the building committee would be composed? Do you have people that you would recommend to join it? I have some thoughts in mind. I mean, the, the stakeholders that I listed off the top of my head just feel like important, um, you know, groups that we're already working with. Um, I started working with Peter Wagner, Director of Community Programs, RSU, but that makes a lot of sense. I mean, they're using our space quite a bit. Um, hmm? The middle school. Yep, so the middle school. I think it's really important to have at least one member of the public, um, and I have a, a handful of really de dedicated library patrons who would probably love that opportunity. Um, I would certainly love somebody from the council. Um, you know, one or two staff members from down here, perhaps the finance director. Peter, you know, we want, we want a good representation. Bradley? <clears throat> you know, and we got a chance to talk across your, your counter. Um, it made me think, I mean, this sounds like a great idea to me, um, but it, I wonder whether um, it wouldn't make sense to, at the same time you're looking at your silo, your, your library, you don't look at how it fits into the downtown and how it fits with trails and ways people get from one place to another and and what other people are doing that are, are like you doing things in arts and culture um, so that we move away from uh, we solve that now we got this and this and this and, and integrate um, that and certainly that's something the committee could look at at the same time is looking at all the things you've just discussed yep. Good. yeah councillor uh, Fournier I guess my only comment is uh, I'd like to see a bid process on an architect. I don't okay. want to go kind of launch with that one. Maybe there's others that would have great ideas, but. Uh, maybe the chief could find us a couple. You know, <laughs> maybe. I'm teasing. But, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I think sometimes uh, we get really comfortable with, with different groups, and, and I think sometimes the more ideas are, are open. I'd like to see open up. I, that's all. And then you're not asking us for money for the architects, right? You have. 
I have funds. Yep. You said I have plenty? No, I said I have funds. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I do have funds for this, yeah. So we can still request it, but we can't <clears throat> demand it. <clears throat> well, I don't think it, uh, what are you thinking that that architecture work would require in terms of dollars? Because your last set of plans did not meet any thresholds, but you did get some quotes for it. Is it right. going to be more than 10,000, 20,000? What range are you hope thinking? not. I mean, I don't know how that, you know, labor costs will have changed in the interim, but I can tell you when we met, um, so Arlene and I met with um, two other firms, um, and they both came in higher than the 10,000 that was appropriated. Simons came in under the 10, and actually then finally came in under budget for that. Um, I would not, I don't expect that it, it would be more than $10,000 to do it because we have all that work we've already done in the other half of the library. We don't have to throw that out. Um, we might reimagine it, but you know, right. that can be incorporated. So it's that really would, looking at spaces that would require quoting anyway. So whatever we want to do, we'll, uh, whatever she wants to do, what she wants to spend, we're working on, Jessica and I have a draft that you and John and I and her are going to talk about, about the bidding policy okay. anyways, but it'll conform to either the current bidding standards or I, I don't think, I'm not, I know Courtney loves them, but I'm not, you know, sold that we need to use the same one. You could convince me that there's a savings there and we could, we could I talk think there's likely a savings there, but I take your point, you know, wanting to, to really look at the field as a whole, which we certainly can. If we set up a committee, do we need a formal order to do that or are we just... No, Co not Courtney can start gathering a group of people together and we'll contribute a counselor. I mean, I don't think... Um, when you brought this idea forward, I don't think it needs a, a council directive to do it, but my direction to her was don't go off and start it. If, like, if five out of seven councilors think your idea is no good, you don't want to go and spend a lot of time developing something and then bring it to the council, and they're like, what are you doing? I mean, I don't think anybody would think your plan is bad, because I think it's really great to pause... Yeah. We've had a lot of discussion yeah. about that. Like, I really appreciate the attitude of like, whoa, that's a lot of money, and whoa, this doesn't take care of everything. Yeah. If we're going to be spending a lot of money, or even if we're going to be spending three hundred thousand dollars, what was the original proposal, the, the dream, yeah. the, the <laughs> bad dream, I guess, of what that <laughs> teen room expansion, the young adult yeah. services would have cost? Yeah. Uh, even then, that's a lot of money, and I think the council at the time. Four years ago, John, you were you were there. Um, there was some heartburn on the council four or five years ago when that three hundred thousand dollar number was discussed. Like, well, that's a lot of money for a small expansion. So yeah. I really appreciate the idea, but at the same time, we don't want to go run off and start developing a grand building proposal if there's not support from the council. So and this is more else. like a consent. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. or support. You know, if nothing else, I mean, you're here representing the community, and I really this is a community project. It, this is this is something to get us another 10, 15 years, maybe more, before, you know, we look at it again. I mean, it's a living, you know, it's a living building, so. I like what you said about potentially coming back with multiple proposals. So there could be like a small, medium, large option, not to add more to like the plate, the but if, best, if that yeah. happens, yeah. that might be a nice thing to yeah, right? put out to the community. Yeah. So yeah, and I think it's a great idea. Thank you for all the work. Fixes everything, done. takes care of the bare minimum somewhere in the middle kind of right. a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I just want to follow up and say thank you, Courtney. I appreciate the details and the, um, the direction that you provided in your memo, and your, I want to applaud your good instincts to mm -hmm. check in on that. I, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get overly dramatic here. I, guess. I can't think of a better place for um, public process than the library that's serving 11 to 14-year-olds as one of the most important places in that age group. I raised three kids in this community, and they all used that library heavily, as did all their friends. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a great asset, and I want to support everything that you're doing to identify that as well as all the other user groups. Um, I'd be a plug for that um, remote worker. I, I go to the, the front porch all the time yeah, exactly. to meet yeah. with folks. <laughs> so I'd, I'd love to see three or four front porches. Right. Um, so thank you much for bringing this forward. You're welcome. Okay. Um, can I ask you guys to shoot me an email or call me if you're interested in serving on this committee, assuming Courtney puts one together, um, and then we can fight it out if we need to. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, everyone wants to work with me. <laughs> so far. Your presentations are pretty good. So. Sweet. Um, thank you for thank coming you. in and sticking Thanks. around. Yeah. I appreciate it.
Not, not parking level good. You're like at a 9.5. You got to get to 10. You got to give me room to grab later. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. Um, can I suggest that we do the administrative stuff to get into executive session, and then we can take a five-minute break while we're technically in executive session, but that'll get the balls rolling on the people that need to deal with cable and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And also getting my little projector set up and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, okay. So yeah. we'll do that. Uh, so um, we're going to consider action relative to an executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA, Section 405, 6A, pertaining to an employment matter. So I'll move that the town council enter executive session. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We do a roll call. Uh, sorry, thank you. Roll call vote. Uh, Councillor Pillsbury? Aye. Councillor Fournier? Aye. Councillor Lawrence? Aye. Councillor Bradley? Aye. Councillor Egan? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So we are now in executive session. Let me shut everything down and I'll um, be back.